Hey everyone, welcome to Game Face, episode 225 on Sifted Games at Sifted.net. I'm Shane Satterfield. I've been doing this stuff for a long time, and you can find me on Twitter at Dinfire. Uh, we got a good crew along with us for today's show. In fact, we have a ton of topics uh, for episode 225. No real big games coming out this week, but a lot of interesting stuff that we're going to discuss. And alongside me to do it is Matthew Kyle. What's up, Matt? Hey. Nobody uh, calls so you- me that unless they're mad at me. <laughs> I rarely call you that, actually, now that I think about it. No, that's just my uh, mom. Yeah. So, Matt, you were, you were talking before the show uh, that you continued to watch some Ven this week, the new gaming TV network, and things mm-hmm. were not going well, right? They had well, a COVID outbreak well, or something? Uh, I heard, there was there's talk of uh, some COVID positive tests over there. Like, I don't know for sure, like, what happened. Uh, but I do know that they were offline for several days. Yeah. Um, so I didn't actually watch that much because they were not on Monday and Tuesday. They're back today with their first new programming since Saturday. Um, and wow. their, their viewer, the viewers were around 320 when I looked at that. So I don't know how that's going for them. Yeah. Not but, good is how it's not going. If they had 300 people for the premiere of the first new content in several days, that's, mm-hmm. I think the messaging is tough too. You know, you get lost yeah. in the mosh online and social media. And on TV, it's like you're always in that schedule. People can DVR your stuff. They can set reminders to show up. When you're just on the internet, it's a little more difficult Mm -hmm. to have appointment viewing, I think, anyway. So you can go, I mean, they do have the shows rerunning and you can go back and see them however you like, pretty much. But Mm -hmm. uh, they were, you know, that's down from like, you know, the the premieres in the first couple of weeks were getting like, you know, eight to 9,000. So that's a drop. A big (laughs) drop to 300. That's a big, big drop. Um, People have been asking me about the Sifted Fantasy Football League, Um, not our fantasy video game league, which just got completely thrown into flux by Halo Infinite being delayed out of 2020, I might add. Uh, Also threw our fantasy league, Matt, into a little bit. Mm -hmm. At first, it looked like I was going to run away with it. Now, not so much. It looks like it could get really interesting before the end of the year. Although I did see uh, an entry for Breath of the Wild 2 popped up on on a site. So, uh, I mean, he's obviously a placeholder because the listing's like December 31st, but that's interesting. Yeah, like, and I have that as my alternate. That's your alternate, so, <laughs> so your alternate could come in out of nowhere. <laughs> there's a chance. Um, that's why I picked it. I was like, there's like a 5% chance it comes out this year, and it's an alternate. I'll take it. Uh, now I may end up needing it. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but people were asking me about our Fantasy Football League, which has been running on Sifted for five years now, believe it or not. Um, I am planning on doing the league, and in fact, I'm going to try to do all my Fantasy Football Leagues this year. Um, if the NFL ends, which it's very likely that it will, and they probably won't finish the season, but if it does, then we're just going to end our fantasy season like it never happened. Um, I'm willing to go through all the work to set it all up. If you guys are willing to play, I sent out an email um, on the league site on ESPN this past week. I have not got a single reply to that so far, so you guys might want to check your inboxes. Uh, but let me know if you guys are into playing. If not, uh, we usually have tons of people trying to get into the league every year. In fact, last year, I think we had three people we had to say no to. So uh, there should be people to fill in if you're not into it, uh, but check your inboxes for that email or just head on over to ESPN.com to the league site. But anyway, we are planning on doing it this year. Um, we'll see how long it lasts. Um, I'd be surprised if the NFL lasts past like week six or seven, but we'll see. Um, they're not in a bubble. They're traveling all over from stadium to stadium, and that's where you get into trouble. That's what's happened with MLB so far. So we'll see. Um, anyway, before we get on with the show proper, it's time to talk about our poll of the week. Our poll of the week last week was one of our most responded polls ever. Not surprisingly, <clears throat> because the poll was the Halo Infinite Delay, dot, dot, dot. And you basically had four options there. Uh, The first option was, has doomed Xbox Series X. That's obviously the extreme on one end. Uh, Next up, next the next response was, it'll make it difficult for Series X to compete. The third one is, it'll probably cause a slow start for Series X. And then the final one was, it won't matter at all because of Microsoft and Xbox's new business model. Um, and I'm sure right now you guys are seeing the results up on the screen. Um, doomed the Xbox Series X, literally half a percent. So very few people chose that option. Uh, I think most people realize that it's a long game, particularly now. Like these aren't even like five-year bets anymore. They're like seven or eight-year bets. 
And I think you guys get that. There's plenty of time for Microsoft to dig itself out. PlayStation did it with PlayStation 3. Uh, to a lesser extent, Microsoft did it with Xbox One. So I think you guys are smart enough to realize that nothing would be doomed because of one game. That's just not how it works. Um, the most popular response, not surprising, it was also the response that I chose, which was it pretty much means it's going to have a slow start. Um, 47% of respondents put, picked that option. Um, I, you know, When your killer app it launches gone, it just pretty much guarantees that it's not going to be as great of a launch as you maybe had anticipated or expected, especially after what happened with Xbox One. I think we all expected something a little bit more coordinated. And I don't know, man, it feels like they're flying by the seat of their pants. How could they be doing this? Yeah, and they don't even have Flight Simulator on the Xbox. Yeah. Like, it's... Um, <laughs> I don't. I mean, I think they're just caught in a in an awkward time. Like I've said multiple times that I think the new system should have been next year. Um, yeah, I've said that, which, which would have given would have given time to kind of get the, the new studios they bought to like have some product ready. Yeah. Um, but I think Sony Sony is going this year, so they got to go this year, and here you are. I mean, it's not like Sony seems Sony doesn't seem to have a whole lot to show for it either. Right? They're now. just being but, quiet right now. They're like, we're yeah. just gonna let Microsoft just doom itself. <laughs> I mean, we once you see that about- Halo demo, you're just like, oh, we can just sit <laughs> back. Like, uh, We do have a PS5 topic later on in the show. There has been some small announcements uh, over the last week, but not big stuff. Uh, Sony's definitely playing it cool right now and just kind of sitting back mm-hmm. and letting things unfold. Um, the next At some most- point, a pre-order's got to go live, though, right? Like, yeah. They somewhere have in there. Yep. Uh, the next most popular response was, um, it's going to make it difficult to compete. That's 27% of respondents. Um, that's looking a little more long, long term there with that response. You're saying that this is going to have ramifications that last beyond the launch window, which we typically call the first three to four months after a console mm-hmm. launches. Like the first quarter or so, yeah. Yeah, so 27% of you think that this is going to be an issue that is going to have long term implications for Xbox Series X. Now, I don't know if multiplayer being free for Halo Infinite might offset that a little bit. We'll see. Um, but a big chunk of you guys think that this is going to have an impact long past the launch window. Um, and then the, the third most popular response was, it doesn't matter. But it was very close to the last response, which was uh, difficult to compete. Um, so a lot of you just have looked at the Xbox ecosystem and said, you know what, with Game Pass, uh, with xCloud incoming, um, with Xbox Live, all these services and programs that Microsoft has, a big chunk of you guys feel like, it doesn't matter anymore to Microsoft um, software in particular. And I can understand that perspective because how big of the launch is Halo Infinite to Xbox when people can subscribe for $10 a month and not have to pay the $60 for it. So the times they are a changing and you guys are picking up on it and you're seeing that it's just like with Apple, you know, everyone was like, Oh my God, Apple's doomed. They're not selling a bajillion iPhones anymore. And Apple was like, Oh, okay. Uh, we'll just start creating all these services that are going to make way more money than the iPhone ever did. And now Apple is making more profit than it ever has. And I think you're trying to, you're seeing Xbox try to kind of transition into that same model. Are you surprised by anything in this poll, Matt? No, nah, that's about where I would figure it would line up. That's, I, I voted for, uh, you know, slow start as well. Because um, it's not, yeah, no, no, nothing comes down to one game anymore, if it ever did. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe maybe back in the 8-bit, 16-bit days it could have with Mario. But um uh, or it can, could come down to one company, like lack of EA on the Dreamcast was a big deal, yeah. um, which is hard to imagine now, but it was. And uh, t- 20 years makes a big difference. And um, like it's, it's the other thing is like I wonder how many people who voted doesn't matter were coming at it from an angle of like Halo wasn't going to move the needle much anyway. So losing it doesn't really make that much of a difference because people were already unimpressed by it and were going to be unimpressed by it. And Halo doesn't have the... 800 pound gorilla status it once did so that's yep. that's a factor too yeah um i don't know like it's certainly i mean not that i was ever going to buy an xbox to play halo specifically but like it was I don't a good know excuse to, yeah it was a good excuse <laughs> and, I, and i don't know what to tell someone who comes to me and is just like oh well, sh- why should i buy an xbox now yeah or why should i buy even if they don't know that halo was ever going to come out for it for launch they're like oh why, why should i get an xbox over a ps5 and i'm like i I can't tell you, you one shouldn't? reason why. Like, I don't, I don't know. Right I, now, I, I can't a... give you one reason other than no. if you're broke 
and you want to play games and you only have about 10 bucks a month to spend on them, then I, I think guess. maybe you could recommend that. But, but, but they maybe still you have to just, put up maybe, the money for the yeah, console. Maybe and, just save $500 <laughs> yeah, and on the console games, and buy a game. Buy 10 games. Yeah. yeah. Or more, the way things are discounted now. True. Uh, so, so anyway, I have some quotes from some of you guys. Um, a lot of the quotes this week in the poll were just straight to the point. No, no flim flam, no BS. You're just like, this is what I think yeah. and this is it. Straight uh, to the point, to the point, no faking. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one comes from Alberg. Uh, he says it's only one game. This is a marathon. So that kind of yeah. uh, portends to the slow start. It's not thing. marathon. It's Halo. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, you're they right. Are, That's a good point. They are pun. related. But... Um, and then shut up, shut up, shut up says uh, slow start is 100% guaranteed, but there is a bigger worry. The fact that they failed to deliver this tells me there are managerial problems. And I've been talking about Phil Spencer for a while. I'm not going to get into that. But anyway, uh, this is a major screw up. I hope they have other games that we don't know about ready for launch. Shut up. I would guess that is not the case. Uh, we would have seen those games. By yeah, it doesn't, doesn't seem like it. I mean, yeah. I'm sure there's third party stuff coming like multi-platform, but. Yep. And then El Tempo yeah. has the same opinion. He says, yep, the entire Xbox division has been mismanaged since Xbox One launched. They really need to clean house. So some people are fed up and I was fed up with it a while ago. And then I felt like Phil started making or started saying the right things. Um, but mm -hmm. it hasn't resulted in execution, in my opinion. Now, at least the execution's slow, if it, at, at any rate. Like, it's just not happening fast enough. Uh, they could have used another year, like I said. But uh, you got to make do with what you got. Like, chances are, or possibly, possibility is that all these new uh, studios they bought will finally start paying dividends next year. Um, like a really good, you know, the good Outer Worlds. Uh, I mean, I know that's multi-platform, but you'll get it on Game Pass probably. Um, uh, Hellblade, uh, Hellblade 2, like there's, there's a lot of stuff in the pipeline that's of interest, but that doesn't help you in November. Yep. Uh, and then the final quote comes from Pain of Demise, and he is in the camp that says it doesn't really matter at all. Uh, he says, I really don't think it matters due to Microsoft's business model, the way they run their run Game Pass, where I can basically play every game that they release on Xbox from now on on my PC. There's no point for me to ever buy an Xbox again. I mean, yeah. I don't know if that's good or not. Uh, I mean, so, that is certainly an interpretation of doesn't matter. Like, doesn't yeah. matter can mean about three different yeah, things. That's true. That's a good point. Uh, so having Halo be delayed has no effect on me. While not everyone is a PC gamer, I still doubt it'll change anyone's minds. They may not make as many sales day one, but when Halo gets released, people will still end up buying the console then, and they'll still end up making their money, which is true. If people really want Halo, no matter when it comes out, they'll buy a console to play the new Halo. So once again, great comments from you guys that run the gamut. Uh, all four options we found quotes for very easily. Uh, and thanks for participating and look for the new poll of the week coming up here on the site in the next couple of days. As always, you'll be able to find it in the header at sifted.net. Uh, so it's time to get on with the show. But before that, here's a word from our sponsor. Ready to get away from it all without losing all the comforts of home? DeShazer Ryan Realty has a once-in-a-lifetime 200-acre estate for sale in Libby, Montana that gives new meaning to the phrase roughing it. This eye-popping main lake house on this sprawling estate has four bedrooms and bathrooms, phone, and internet. There are also separate guest and caretaker houses. It's the first time this property has ever been for sale, so don't let the chance to buy a slice of outdoor heaven pass by. It can be yours for $3.4 million. If you're interested, no matter where you live, contact Doug DeShazer at 406-291-1643 or DeShazerMT at gmail.com. He can also connect you with local realtors who can help you with your specific needs. If you want to see more, head on over to www.snowshoeranchmt.com. That's snowshoeranchmt.com. Game phase again makes a huge, huge difference for us. Thank you so, so much. So before we get started, so if you if you uh, recut that with a different audio track, you can make that into a horror trailer like, pretty, pretty <laughs> <You're> well. <right. laughs> it actually looks like a VR trailer because it does like the walking, yeah, like, the walkthrough right? thing. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Uh, but anyway, before we get started with the show proper, uh, we have a lot of topics in today's show. I think there's like nine. Uh, typically, we have like five or six, but usually there's like a big game or two in there. Um, so we're going to go a little faster today. We're not going to stay on topics very long because we need to get through them all before the end of the show because I think everyone is important and it's going to be a fun discussion. So if we're a little ADD for episode 225, I just wanted you guys to understand why. I'm just trying to get through all the stuff that we have to get through. 
And we're going to kick things off with what I think is probably the biggest story for like otaku this week um, and insiders and people who really love the industry. For casuals, probably not so much. Uh, but this week, out of nowhere, well, to us, it was out of nowhere. But in hindsight, it really wasn't. Um, Epic sued Apple. Uh, oh, first, well, let me go chronologically. So first, what happened was Fortnite launched a payment system that went around the Apple Store. So mm -hmm. people who are playing the game on iOS devices were able to buy stuff from the store and Apple was not getting its cut. So and it was cheaper. And it was cheaper. And so Apple basically dropped Fortnite from the App Store and from its OS and everything. And then Epic sued Apple for what I'm still not sure, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and released, Monopoly. It was, it's an antitrust. Okay. And then released this video that you're seeing right now, which is a parody of Apple's 1984 commercial. If you guys remember that commercial, it was from decades ago. And it was Apple was just trying to get his foot in the door. Um, and it made this George Orwell-like mm -hmm. commercial that has become iconic over the years. And so yeah. Epic it's the, it's the announcement of the Macintosh, the, right. the 1984 trailer. Like it, it changed advertising. Yep. Um, and so they and made it was a the most expensive that. commercial ever made at the time. I at think. the time, yeah. And so Epic has made a parody of that, which is what you're seeing right now. Um, and they made that like the Bloomberg tweeted. Uh, one of the Bloomberg reporters tweeted about the the Apple banning Fortnite, and Fortnite announced the nineteen the 1980 Fortnite trailer one minute later. It was all like planned. they were ready. Yeah. Like they, and this, I think this does spin out of the antitrust stuff that was brought up with Apple and Google and Facebook and everyone earlier, like you know, last year. Um, like clearly, Epic knew this showdown was coming, and yeah, it had that had, trailer ready to yeah, go. They had an arsenal prepared. Yeah. Like they were, they had a whole plan in place to get out from under Apple's thumb here. Yep, and it got worse. So, <laughs> so they sue Apple. Apple says, well, obviously, we're not going to put Fortnite back on the App Store. And then Epic was like, well, okay, we can play that game too. And they started talking about pulling Unreal Engine from iOS. And it has just become this dirty, like, it's gross, <laughs> to be perfectly mm -hmm. honest with you. Watching these two gigantic corporations that are more profitable than anything Argue over money is pathetic, in my opinion. You have 30 million people unemployed in the United States right now, and these companies are arguing over money like this publicly. This could have all been handled behind the scenes between the two companies, but obviously that was not Epic's plan all along. It, as Matt said, it made that trailer. That trailer didn't just happen in five minutes. That trailer was done and in the can a long time ago. That, it was all a part of Epic's plan to put pressure on Apple. Um, now, my now, guess is that they did try to handle this in turn, like privately. Maybe. And Apple, Apple, Tim Cook in particular, particular is very against any alteration to the cut because that is part of Apple's business plan. Yeah. To the extreme, the and the and, you know sort of like how the whole thing happened. You know, basically, Epic's also trying to do what they did with Valve with this with Steam, Steam. where Steam yeah. gets almost, I think, a similar cut. Uh, from there, yeah, and like the Epic's same. like, we're going to take less, so go for it. And the and you know, obviously, you can do an end run around Steam in a way you can't around the App Store because Apple's platform is a closed platform. Yeah, um, but that is sort of the crux of what they're attempting here. The most interesting thing about this is if Epic wins this, it opens up a lot of avenues to other similar uh, situations with things like Google and Facebook. Like, yeah, it's a Pandora's if, box. Yeah. Uh, I would actually say it's a good thing. I, I, don't, I wouldn't call it a Pandora's box. I think uh, it would take some of these massive companies that are bordering on monopolies down a peg. Um, in fact, and well, like little things like stuff, not as like as big as like Epic because of like you lose, if you lose the Unreal Engine tools uh, for app store developers, like that's a massive hit to like everyone who's working, you know, that's, that's people have to re smaller developers will have to reevaluate their business model on the app store in a way that just no one could have anticipated. But like you're talking about like, you know, Yelp has been trying to do a similar thing with Google the last couple of years, but if, but this could be a crack in the armor of the giants, basically if Apple loses and I think they will. Why it, do you it, think they'll lose? Because didn't Epic, I mean, Epic signed contracts with Apple for the app store. It agreed to the 30% cut. Yeah. But um, I don't, I don't think there's anything in there that says they can't offer a different service. Hmm. Um, and you, and they will also probably be leveraging the fact that Android didn't do that. 
because they yeah, did the same thing on that, Android. I mean, if you it, sign on the dotted line, if they tell you we're going to take thirty percent of revenue, and you no, say it it's doesn't, okay, and you sign the contract, that doesn't that. matter. No, it doesn't matter because if you can prove that that contract is is a monopolistic practice, it gets thrown out. So that's what they're going to be going for. Um, and considering that was, and this is interesting also in the sense that like of the companies that were brought up before Congress on this, Apple kind of got out the easiest. Like yeah. Tim Cook kind of came and said, no, we just do our thing. This is how the app store works. We're cool. And like, they kind of, they kind of, the, you know, the, the, the judiciary was kind of like, all right, like, sure. I get that. And like, yeah, we want to talk to Zuckerberg anyway, you know, so who cares? <laughs> but like, it uh, is little, to me, it is a little weird that you can build something and look, they haven't like built the app store by acquiring other companies and like absorbing their competitors. Mm -hmm. They just build it. So it's weird to me that you can build something that people love so much that then later on they're like, oh no, that's a monopoly. Like, I don't think that's a, that's fair. I'll be honest. I don't know if monopoly is the right word for it. Um, but like, like, I don't think it should be illegal either. Like if you build something that people love and you haven't like consumed the rest of the market and formed a true monopoly and took out your competition, mm -hmm. like, I, I just don't think it, it, they should mess with Apple. I'll be honest with you. Like, I think, look, well, that's the thing I, is, I, I think that I think they just want a fair deal for people yeah, putting stuff on the do. App Store, of which is like, do. like they don't want to, they don't want to like take down Apple's App Store and like make the iPhone and like open platform. They want to say like, hey, we want to renegotiate this, and they're not willing to renegotiate it. So you kind of you kind of blow it up, like, and we'll see if it works. I think they I think they might have a point um, that that uh, legally, but again, it depends whether any where their Apple settles. It depends whether. I mean, this is a silly thing to say. It depends whether Epic is willing to spend the money to see this through to the end. Obviously, Epic, if anyone has the money <laughs> to see enough. this through to the end, it is Epic. <laughs> For sure. Um, Epic's is just because also like, you know, I, I get that there's people that are mad at Epic about this and I, I get it because like this is sort of Epic's MO. Like, like we, they're basically saying like, we are rich as fuck. So we're going to try to shake things around. up. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know well, the other thing too bullying, is they're mobilizing they're their audience of 11 to 14 year old kids to go after mm -hmm. an app. That's the dirtiest thing of it all, in, a, in all honesty. Them using, putting out that trailer and using their gigantic fan base to try to get movement. Knowing that most of these people are like, aren't even the age of to vote. Like, I don't know. Uh, to me, Epic is in the wrong in this. Like, I understand that they're like 30% sucks, but then you just don't go, when your contract ends, you just leave. Like, is, if you don't like it, leave. And that's how the market changes. If the developers get sick of it, people like Epic, um, and they stop making games for the App Store, that's what's going to make Apple uh, change its mind and lower the cost. But I don't know if it will, because Apple doesn't give a shit about games. Like, Apple has always been a little behind on how important video games are. Um, obviously, Apple Arcade and things like, you know, it's gotten better, certainly under Tim Cook. Um, but I think, I don't think they quite grasp the size of Fortnite, the size of what gaming is. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and they will, uh, cause the, I mean, again, well, like what you're, in what, the last couple days. <laughs> yeah. Well, what you're describing again is like, you know, is, is, are you wrong? No, but like that scenario hurts the consumers too. Like, mm -hmm. because all of a sudden all these kids, like you say, these same kids who love Fortnite can't play it on their Apple devices anymore. And it's, and you know, then you're, then you got a kid going to your mom. It's like, I need a, I need a Samsung yep. now. You know, it's like, <laughs> probably not, not today anyway. Um, so yeah. like, it's, yeah, this is, and also like Apple is kind of monolithic about this. Like you can't ignore the iPhone market. You can't ignore the iOS market. So, and if Apple won't play, it won't, you know, even come to the table on it. What else do you have? Like that's, that's, that's the leverage. That, that's business. That's how it works. Like, so like it's, it's not, it's nasty that a bunch of like consumers and, and customers and young consumers are caught in the crossfire on this to some degree, but like, uh, I but cannot, I can't deny that this is, I can't deny that this is going to be interesting. Like, yeah, I don't right. know, I don't know what this is going to turn out to be. I think, well, I, I think, the think I'd rather is, bet on Epic on this one, but we'll see. I think the funny part is, is that they're blaming Apple but they should be blaming Epic because if they love Fortnite and they're pissed off that they can't play it on their iPhone now, that's not Apple's fault. It's Epic's fault. Epic oh. sued Apple and then Apple took it off. So, but again, Epic was smart. It's like, oh, they may see the truth in this. So we're going to put out a trailer that, that we're going to use to gather well, our troops together and, t and get our message to them before they can start thinking about it themselves. Well, here's the thing though, like they didn't, do that. They did the end run with the with the purchase thing, 
And instead of enforcing the contract that you seem to think they have, which maybe they don't. I mean, uh, you have to have a contract. Then why isn't Apple suing them? Because they probably want Fortnite on iOS. <laughs> well, yeah, but like, so, so instead of like, you know, taking legal action to enforce their contract, they just banned Fortnite from their platform. Well, they is, know that when they go to court, they're going to bring in the contracts and they're going to win the case. I mean, well, one way or the other, you're going to court. So it's, yeah. but it's weird to wait for the other guy to sue you to then win that well, on the defensive. Well, they had to wait until, until they this didn't. happened. It's happened. Well, they had to wait until they set up that other revenue stream. But as soon as that happens, you can then take them to court for breach of contract if that's in their contract. So yeah. why didn't Apple do that? And instead they did this kind of passive aggressive. Well, probably because Fortnite. Apple wanted to work it out. <laughs> they didn't want to have to go to court. Well, then you, like, call, you call Tim Sweeney. I mean, the, I'm sure the, they Tim, did. The Tim's got to talk instead of just banning Fortnite. I'm like, sure they did. I yeah, mean, well, I'm, sure there's, I'm sure this has been going on for months. Like yeah. this has probably been a back and forth for a long time. And then Apple yeah. threatening to pull like and ban any kind of like Unreal Engine tools from the iOS platform is like, now you're threatening the livelihoods of tons of developers. Like no one is handling this particularly well. No, on you're right. Side. It is ugly across the board. You're right. Um, and there's a lot of little guys caught in the crossfire. Um, yep. So on that, on that, you're definitely right. Like you're talking about two giant billionaires, like arguing over, you know, and you know, who cares about the record. It's a little bit like the end of man of steel. You're wrecking the city. And I know what you're fighting about is important, but there's people getting nailed in the process. Well, it's like you look at Epic's month revenue. It's like mm -hmm. obviously you're okay making losing thirty percent on yeah. iOS. Like at the same at the same time though, like I I don't throw Epic under that bus quite the same way. Uh, not no, look the bus showed up right as I said that. <laughs> um, the uh, because if Epic is successful on this, um, that cut in the that, that reduction of the cut. Um, basically means that it will benefit a lot of other developers yeah, too. Like sure. the, it could be good for everybody except Apple. And Epic um, and is Apple's incentivized fine. to do that because so many developers use their yeah. tools. And Epic is, yeah, Epic has all those relationships with all those developers. Yeah. Um, and don't forget, like the way that Tim Cook got out of the congressional hearing on it about how like, oh, like they asked him about like the, the cut and like, oh, but there are ways, because one of the accusations was that there were like certain, certain games or certain companies that got a better deal on the app store and they're like well what's they're like well what determines that and tim cook basically said um well if they meet certain criteria they can get the better deal and that that's was it. that was the answer <laughs> it's just like okay, what well, like that doesn't most that's of the people nothing. in congress are like over 65 right. so well, and also like enough of, the people enough, in, them. enough of the people in congress know what that means yeah because yeah, exactly. they've done it too so it's like <laughs> That's the part of the problem is like in situations like that, like most well, of the like, people well, are like, well, I've been having skimming 40% right. my whole life. <laughs> exactly. like, you're dealing with people that have all been doing the same shit. So they're all sort of yeah. like winking at each other in millionaire. Yeah. You know, oh, that's like, terrible. So, yeah. Oh, that's oh, no, no, I would never do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hear you. Uh, so anyway, this isn't over by a long shot. Um, we're probably no. going to get back to this until there's a resolution on it, though. It's not something we're going to keep talking about. Yeah, this is going to go on for probably I mean, if, it, if it goes on. through the courts as uh, you know, procedurally, it'll go on for a while unless one of them blinks or and they I, settle I, or. Yeah. yeah. Well, I feel like that's going to be Apple, like Apple's going to blink or they're going to go to the bitter end because I don't see Epic backing down on this. It's too Epic. much money to lose for Apple, I think, for them to back down. I think it's going to go to court. I That's think you're I probably right. I, yep. I, I would think it's too so. much on both sides. Honestly, they both have war chests big enough to do it. Do they it. Yep. they both have a lot of money Incentive on the line to do it. Yeah. Um. And app and Epic wants to look like the hero to the developers that that the white work with guy. them. Yep. So like I think yeah I think this could come down. So, you, I mean I'd like I'd watch some of these things televised if they did. I, I would too. This, I, most people wouldn't, but we would. No, we would. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's just I. Th this is a whole thing. Like this is and especially yeah. for the, this like kind of mobile side of the industry that you don't really get to. You know, it's sort of like been the wild west for a while. Yeah. And this this could like codify it into something that is more of a uh, more of a standardized system for like what what you get paid, what your cut is, what was fair, what isn't fair. Um, and you know, I under, you know, on one hand, it's bad for who has to put up with it in the meantime. But on the other hand, like when Apple's running the show the way they are, like this might be the only way to negotiate with them. Yep. So anyway, we'll go, we'll come back to it when there's some resolution on it. I don't think that'll be for like another year though. Probably so, not. <laughs> we we won't be coming It'll, back. I mean, it might take that long just to get the ducks in a row for like discovery before I mean, it even goes to court. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's going to be a long, long battle between those two. And so other if you play people, Fortnite on on iOS, you might want to think about moving you to something else. You might want to get an Android phone. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk next about the latest on Xbox Series 
S, not X, S. Uh, we talked about Lockhart before here on the show. It is the, well, I think, I think we can say now it's no longer just rumored. It is the lower powered version of Xbox Series X. We really didn't know how underpowered it was going to be compared to, compared to Series X until this week when the specs started leaking out. Uh, this information does come from a very reliable source, but as always with rumors, take them with a grain of salt. But I would put this at a, probably an 80% hit rate for this, uh, this source. And this source says that it is going to have the same CPU as the Xbox Series X, but the GPU is going to be vastly underpowered compared to Series X. Uh, the GPU is only going to run at around four teraflops. Uh, and what is Series X is what, 11 teraflops? Is that right? Or 10? Yeah, I want to say 11 or 12, yeah. Yeah, somewhere around there. So obviously a huge, huge downgrade. Yeah. But I mean, the is- teraflop comparison, you know, developers always warn like that right. doesn't really mean everything, anything. Like if you're comparing between like, you know, PS5 does like nine and Xbox does 11 or 12. Like that's not the end of the world. But like when you're talking about four versus that. 12. That's yeah, a, there's that's a, a big difference. <laughs> there's, yeah, you're you're going to see that. There's yes. no fuzzy math that's going to spackle over those discrepancies. So yeah, even is, with even with the faster hard drive, you're going to be seeing yep. some def, definitely going to see the, the settings turned down. Yep. And they said the target for it is 2K resolution at 60 frames per second. And mm-hmm. if they can hit that, with that cheaper model, do you think that's good enough, Matt? That's pretty good, yeah. Yeah. Like, like 2K, 2K is 2K is fine. Like, like 2K, I mean, telling the difference between 2K and 4K is hard. Like yeah. you, you have to have a trained eye. I mean, my much. PC monitor is 2K because like frankly, the the distance I sit away from it, 4K doesn't make sense. It's not right. you know, I'm too close to it. But 2K, I mean the difference between 1080p and 2K, the old monitor and the new monitor, night and day. Like it's great. Um, you can get that with HDR, like even better, like, uh, for the, for the money they, you know, who knows what the price on this would be, but that's a pretty freaking good deal. And I can see why they'd be getting rid of the Xbox one X and the, the one series, yep. because this thing's going to be about the same amount of money. And it's going to be, a, it's definitely gonna be better than the one X. Was the one um, X two teraflops, two point something. I, I don't can't quite, remember. I can't remember. Someone in chat maybe can fill us in on that, but, um, but it's definitely gonna be better than that. And uh, for similar money, so I can see why you're getting rid of those SKUs as fast as possible and just sort of limiting it to the series stuff. Um, so I mean, it's not; it, it wouldn't be what I'd get because I'm a, you know, I'm a snob about that kind yeah. of thing. But like, but don't you think it probably will be good enough? Yeah, for absolutely. Most consumers, I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it's definitely going to be an upgrade from the current gen stuff. Yeah, oh, that's I mean, all you'll, you'll you be able to see the difference for sure yeah. um, from current gen, even if you had a One X. You know, mm-hmm. the the Series S will be oh, yeah. a, a marked upgrade over the One X. Um, let's see if anybody got us the teraflops for One X. Nope, not yet. Six, six teraflops for One X. Oh wow! But that's it's an way older chip. more than I thought. But that's again, that's why the teraflop thing doesn't right. matter. <laughs> it is. It's all relative to the rest of the architecture and your pipelines and mm-hmm. and all that kind. It's of not stuff. like it's not like bits anymore. You know, it's like yep. sixteen bit, thirty two bit. It's like that. It's not like and not. You know, that stopped mattering after a while too. It did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, do you think that it might outsell the Series X? I think it might. I mean, it's not impossible. Um, again, I don't see a whole lot of reason to buy one yet. Um, whether, you know, I mean, for me, it's, it depends on the price. Like if this thing's half the price of the Series X, yeah. Like, sure, that's a that's What if a, it's uh, like thing. three and the Series X is five? I mean, for me, I would just save up and get the five. Spend, get this at the X. Me too. Um, but not everyone's like us. But if you're not going to do that, if you'd rather have a few games, um, it's a pretty good entry, especially depending on what the PS5 looks like. Price wise, yep. um, which I guess gets into whether the discless uh, PS5 is going to be what kind of price cheaper. that's going to come in at. Yeah, um, I can't see it being that much cheaper. Whereas, like this seems like it would be a drastic price drop from the from the X, um, just because of the, the 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 hardware, the differential between the two. Um, but I guess we'll see. Like that could be Xbox's one one real advantage is that they have a an economy model. Uh, for anyone w- wanting to jump into the next gen, and, and one set. that is not no slouch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if these like that, specs yeah. are legit, that's no slouch. Yeah, if you, even if you put this like on demo in Best Buy or something, like you're going to see the difference on that thing. Yeah, you're going to you're going to see Valhalla looks better on this oh, than yeah. on your your PS4. Obviously, or whatever. obviously, for sure. Uh, the other thing that was just announced today, they put out the debut trailer 
for the new Xbox experience, basically the Xbox dashboard. Unfortunately, the trailer came out too late for us to be able to show it to you guys in the show, but I do have all the information uh, from the trailer. And so it's basically the new UI for Xbox, but it's not just for Xbox Series X and Xbox Series S. It goes all the way back to the older consoles as well. They said that there were three tenets that they worked on when they redesigned the UI. It was effortless, fast, and welcoming. Those were the three things that they mm-hmm. wanted to make sure the storefront did. Um, well, that so, second one will be a change. Yes. Um, well, they said that they've made it faster in every way. We'll see if that's the case. Yeah. Uh, I've been using my Xbox One a lot more lately because I got YouTube TV and it's turned into like my cable box. So I have to use the UI on it a lot. And it mm-hmm. is still just laggy. It is real sluggish. Yep. And sometimes it just like hangs, like because I'll start it up, and I do have an external hard drive hooked to it because um, I ran out of space pretty fast. But like, there are times when I go in and I go to the thing, I go to the the game, the, you know, my library thing, and like, it's nothing there. Yeah, like, it just doesn't load in, and I go back out and I come back in, and now it's there, or it doesn't know how much space is left on the hard drive until I like check the store, or like updates don't pop up for like twenty minutes, and by then I'm already playing again. It's 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 weird. Like I I can't quite figure out the speed and the, and the process at which it, the, the, the OS works on the Xbox one is better than when it launched, obviously, but it still feels just like, it feels like held together with duct tape even today. Yep. I'd agree with that. Um, a hundred percent. Uh, just still after all this time, it's very sluggish and it just doesn't yeah. feel snappy. Um, I am. I will always be blown away by the fact that one of the reasons master chief collection didn't work for four years is because the online was somehow broken in terms of how it worked with the OS and 343 said that they had to update the Xbox one OS before they could fix the multiplayer fully in master chief collection. And I don't know, you know, I don't know enough tech stuff to know why that would be, but that just blows my mind. Like that, that was a problem that the OS was literally holding them back from making last gen games work online. Uh, The other thing that they said they focused on was making sure that they optimize the most used apps. So obviously they have tons of data on what apps people use the most. And so they targeted those and they made sure that they focus specifically on those really popular apps running as quickly and smoothly as possible. And they said as a result of those changes that they made, the UI is already sucking 40% less memory, which is huge. That's good. Huge. Um, That was a big problem for the Xbox One. That thing had a huge footprint. Yep, absolutely. Um, And then as you guys know, a big part of everything now is social media and how that stuff is integrated. And they're going all in on that. And not just all in just on social media, but going all in on your phone specifically. Hmm. Uh, For instance, the new capture tools that they're installing for the new OS will send, you capture something and then it's immediately sent to your phone just automatically. And then you can choose what to do with it from there. What platforms you want to share it on, if you want to edit it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, So they're trying to shorten the time between you playing and getting what you're doing game-wise out onto social media. Um, I don't know that that will affect me all that much. Like, the only time I ever really upload stuff directly from my console is if I find, like, a glitch or a goofy, like, scene or a clip, Mm -hmm. stuff like that. Like, I don't just, like, play the game and post it. I know a lot of people do. Uh, you don't do Facebook. a lot of that, but it would be, I mean, when I was taking screenshots at Ghost of Tsushima, like 50 a day, it would have been nice enough to plug a, a flash drive into the PS4 yeah. to get it out. Like, that, yep. would, that. I think that's a, it's not like I would use that all that often either, but I like that feature. That's a good feature. I use it I'd for gamey it vowels all the time. Yeah. I'll snap, I snap screenshots for our gamey vowels and then I have to use a thumb drive to get them off of my mm-hmm. PS4 and load them onto my PC. Blah. The one thing I do miss about the Kinect and not enough to hook it back up again, but like, uh, what like early on when you could when something happened in the game you could just say Xbox record, record that and yeah. it would just save the last like however much it, like that was really cool. It wasn't Matt, worth my connect everything is hooked else, up but. again because you have to. So if you want the Xbox One to control your TV and like your receiver, so basically what mm-hmm. I do is I have a, a Xbox remote. I hit the the home button and it turns everything on. The Xbox comes on, the TV comes on, the receiver comes on. And then whenever I'm done, I hit the button again, choose turn off, and it turns everything off. The only way you can do that, though, with the Xbox One is with the Kinect. For some reason, that technology is built into the Kinect instead of the console. Mm -hmm. So I have had to hook my Kinect back up now that I have cut the cord and went with YouTube TV. Um, And then the final note is that the new UI is not just for the new consoles. It's going to go back to all of them. So Xbox One, Xbox One X, 
Um, both of those consoles will also use this new UI. They're not going to keep the old UI on the mm. old consoles. So update the 360, you cowards. <laughs> I don't think it's going to go back that far. <laughs> yeah. but, I did turn mine on recently. Y- you did? Because uh, I had to get some saves off of it. I uh, boxed mine up at least a long put, time I always put them up to the cloud. I have ev- everything's hooked up. I got my original my original Xboxes here hooked up here. Wow. I have my Saturn here. I got uh, the Wii U. I got the Wii. Not the Wii. The Wii's not here. The GameCube is up there. Um, all of my stuff is stacked in their boxes, all complete with all their packaging and their little pamphlets that came with them in a closet right mm. over my shoulder here. Dreamcast's and, not out. The Dreamcast should probably come out. So you own a home, so you can just spread yeah. your stuff out. Like, I have an apartment, and all of my closets are like Jenga. And I just yeah. redid them all as well. I got rid of a bunch of stuff and restacked everything. Yeah, um, that was my apartment. I, to the point that I was like, wow, I really... I, it was almost impressive. The stuff that came out of one of those, the, the big closet in the second bedroom. I'm like, man, man I'm good at that. Like, I, 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 I could not inch. believe it. Yeah. I have a step um, stool, like our ceilings yeah. are really high. So I'm like taking the box and just putting it on the top and then poking mm-hmm. it back. So it goes all the way back to the wall. It's funny. But, uh, uh, but yeah, this room is basically my old system room. And then like the main room is like where I, you know, the PS4, uh, the PS4 and the Xbox and the, the switch are all up over there. Yep. But this is this is this is also where I have my old uh, plasma because I refuse yep. to get rid of that. Because transition so time, nice. getting ready to pack up my PS4 and my Xbox One as well. So yeah, I'm hoping the new systems make it so I don't have to have them hooked up at all anymore. Yeah, exactly. Uh, with the backwards compatibility. Yeah, so. especially with the new Xbox. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, that's the latest updates on Xbox Series S. Personally, I don't know if that's true. Look, I don't need more than 60 frames per second. I'll be honest with you. Like, 60 is good for me, man. I don't need 120. Yeah. In fact, when I play I'll, 120, a lot of times it just makes me sick. So I don't mind 120. I mean, look, I am I think steady is more important than agreed. the number. Like, if you yeah. want to give me 60, great. Keep it at 60. You want to give me 120? Keep it at 120. Like, as long as it doesn't jump up and down, I'm fine. Like, I, I, I just... I consistency is all I ask really. Yeah. Uh, so, and if, if they want to make 60 a priority, like, cool. I didn't think anybody would do that really. Uh, this gen, uh, you yeah. know, I figured that, but if they think they can do that, cool. If that's the specs, like I would be totally okay with buying that console. I won't because I need to buy the better version because of what I do for my vocation. But as a consumer, I don't know, man, if I could get that for 300 bucks and the other one's 500, it, it would be a tough question for me to decide which one I would get. Yeah. Um, uh, I do think ultimately the more powerful console will sell more than the cheaper one, maybe. but I think it'll be closer than people think. I'll put it that way. Well, I mean, um, remember the most powerful console, when was the last time one, they won the generation? Like it never does. Never does. I mean, PS4 did. Yeah. And it was marginally more powerful than it was. Console. Yeah. I don't know. Not anymore. Nope. Uh, that's it. The X, <laughs> yeah. the X is better, but like yeah. Over time, Microsoft lapped them eventually, but out of the gate, the, PS4 out of the gate, was way, yeah, it was much more powerful. Yeah. Uh, not more powerful. I mean, it, whatever. It noticeably it more powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff stuff ran better on it. Like that's you know, all I knew. Yeah. Because um, the original the launch Xbox One had that slow ass RAM because they needed yep. more RAM to deal with the giant footprint of the OS. <laughs> yep, it's absolutely true. Uh, then the final tidbit is that we don't know the release date for Xbox Series X yet, but we know the month. It's November. Um, yeah. So I'm still saying like November 17th. That's my that's my bet. It makes sense. It's usually that week from the 17th mm-hmm. to like the 23rd or the 24th. That's, that's uh, it's Black yeah, Friday that, and all and that that's stuff uh, that. Valhalla is, yep. is that day. That's right. And then and then you get Cyberpunk two days later, or maybe maybe be the 19th because I don't know, I don't remember what day, if there's a pref, preferred day that hardware comes out. I don't like, either, honestly. I mean, I um, prefer the weekend. It'd be the perfect is the perfect launch is a Friday night. Right. You hang but, with your, um, you hang with everybody in line on the Friday night if they even the do fr- it this way. That's but. possible. Okay, so yeah, so uh, Valhalla is that Tuesday, the seventeenth, and then Cyberpunk, the nineteenth. Is that the day? The nineteenth. Yeah, I think because so. that's Thursday. That's weird. I think that might be the date. That might be that might be your hint. <laughs> Thursday think that night really might be it. Yeah, like technically 19th. the you know technically the twentieth is launch day, but it comes out the night of the nineteenth. Like it's smart it's, though because think about how many people are just going to be going to the game store to get Cyberpunk. I mean, right? It, it makes too much sense. I mean, I, look, I, ain't, I ain't going to a store for this shit. Well, no, <laughs> a lot of actually a lot of people. Was, won't yeah, know. even if there was no pandemic, I haven't <laughs> gone to an actual launch of a game system in like. Two generations. I like them. I like going and hanging out with everybody. Uh, So anyway, that's the latest updates on Xbox Series X. Uh, We don't. (laughs) There are not going to be many more updates because it's going to be here pretty soon. Uh, Next, we're going to talk about Grand Theft Auto Six, and we're going to tie it into a discussion 
that's been kind of ongoing because this has been become a recurring theme at Rockstar over the last couple of years. Um, and basically the big news this week is that Laszlo Jones, a long time, long term Grand Theft Auto developer, writer, he is also the DJ that has been in the games all along, has left Rockstar. He also was one of the lead writers on the franchise. Um, for better or worse in some cases, he did write a lot of the radio stuff that was in the game, and that stuff was kind of hit or miss. But I think the bigger question here, at least for me, is so we saw Dan Hauser leave. Um, we've seen a couple, we saw Le Leslie Benzies leave. Now Laszlo has left. These are the icons, the pillars, the figureheads of Rockstar Games, all gone, except for Sam Hauser. And then in the same, like, 24-hour period, we get news that Rockstar has registered GTA Vice City Online as a domain, um, which means that makes a lot of people wonder if Grand Theft Auto 6 is really just going to be the next iteration of Grand Theft Auto Online. And then when you start taking it into consideration that the two biggest writers on the franchise just left in the span of a few months, and Leslie was gone a while ago, and the core of Rockstar is kind of gutted. What is going on over there, Matt? Is Grand Theft Auto 6 going to be some online-only game as a service? I mean, that's not impossible. I don't I don't think so, necessarily. I don't either. I'll be honest. Because um, here's the other thing. Like, they are figureheads. That you're talking about like people that built this franchise, but at the same time, they've been around for a long, long time. And uh, they've served their time. You know, some of these Hopefully people probably they have... have protégés that they were... Yeah, and also, like, mentoring. some of these people, I'm sure, have, you know, have done well enough that they can probably retire, more or less, here, or at least semi-retire. Um, and why wouldn't you? Um, the other thing is, like, Grand Theft Auto has, you know, kind of prided itself on being sort of an edgy satire since, at least since, since the beginning, I would yeah. say. I mean, the, yeah, the old, even the, the, even, the first game. Yeah. Even the old ones were like that. The PS1 games were like that. But especially since 3. Um... Which and three, of course, mainly was that way through the radio. Um, and the thing about satire is it doesn't usually age tremendously well unless you do it really, really well. If you want an example of how it's done really, really well, watch Mel Brooks. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, He's the king. <laughs> yeah. And um, one of the key things about good satire is you can't co opt it to support the thing it's satirizing. And one of the best, that's one of the best kind of litmus tests for that. And uh, Mel Brooks cannot be co-opted to, to, <laughs> to support anything he's making fun of. He's very good at that. Um, I don't think the same can be said of a lot of the comedy in Grand Theft Auto and the satire in Grand Theft Auto, especially as it ages. It's a little um, too timely, I think. It is a little problem. timely, and it's also very beholden, and I think they've had this problem for the last two games. It's a little stuck in the early to mid-2000s. Yeah. And Laszlo's departure to me is a very good sign. Interesting. Because um, not that I want anything bad to happen to him because sure. I'm, sure, I'm sure he's fine. I'm sure he you just want good things to happen and, to the games. Right. And I, but I do think his stuff was the cringiest, most tired humor in the games uh, over the last two, especially five. Like he, I couldn't listen to that the radio station that had DJ Laszlo on it for more than a couple of minutes. Like it was just it's painful. It's just yeah. hard to get it because it just felt archaic. It was like, it's like, here, here's a current reference for you. It's like watching Star Trek Lower Decks, if you've seen any <laughs> of that. It's, I haven't seen it, but I know what it is. It's like yeah, a, it's a, it's a cartoon it's a Star about Trek like, cartoon about like the rank and file workers. Right. Right. Yeah. right. Named after an episode of The Next Generation called The Lower Decks, where you actually saw like the ensigns and kind of what they did day to day and what it was like to not be like fancy guy on the bridge. Right. Um, but this is like, it's by one of the Rick and Morty writers and it's just like a slapstick comedy, like wacky comedy thing. And it's like, it's, it's just sort of tired general ha ha banter humor. And then like the Star Trek humor is like stuff. The fandom has been joking about since like 1988. Mm. It's, and like it's probably the first time like a mainstream audience has ever heard of it. But if you're, but I don't know if a mainstream audience is watching a Star Trek comedy yeah, cartoon. Yeah. So like but to if me, you're actually it's, a Trekkie, then you've known right. it it's old and. And well. I'm not even like a huge hardcore Star Trek fan or anything, but I've heard all these before on Usenet in the '90s, and like <laughs> having them repeated by professional voice actors is not that much of a thrill to me. And like it, it's like that. It's like. If you're going to do that, you have to move past what has already been established. And a lot of the writing in five, especially didn't. 
yeah. and bringing in new blood for six is exactly what they need. Um, and like Red Dead Redemption Two didn't suffer from that so much because Red Dead Redemption Two isn't dealing with the same kind of thing. It's you know the setting's different. Whereas GTA Six, whatever this happens to end up being, and if it's Vice City, um, so at the very least is going to take place in Florida, right? I mean, the other um, thing is that hard to say whether that would be an Vice 80s City period have been around for a long time. Yeah, That's those have the been other around. thing. Like um, the, the rumors it, has been that Grand Theft Auto Six is going to be set in Vice City. That yeah. has been the now, sort of the word around the industry. I mean, but that also never really meant anything to me because people have said that for like four games already. Like, and the other thing is like, I don't know why Rockstar seems to have hit this point where they they set these games in one of three places and that's it. Yeah, like, I know. <laughs> I don't know why you would feel the need to stick to Vice City. I mean, the only thing I could think of would be like how prominent the Florida man thing is in yeah. today's news culture. Yeah. Um, or I guess go back to the 80s, but that feels really weird to me at this point. Like, um, because the eight, I mean, God, the they what, did that already. They did that already. And Vice, I mean, Vice City came out in like 2004. Was that right? Yeah. That, I mean, the thing that um, reminds me too is that you know I love the soundtracks in these games, and they, yeah. I mean, they've already done the 80s soundtrack like they have. Uh, very well, I would add. And um, it's just, it just doesn't, it, you know, like San Andreas was done well in in 1992 in San Andreas, and then they yeah. went back to San Andreas for five, but they sent it, set it in modern times, which I right. think is what a Vice City in GTA Six would be as well. Um, so there's some, there's some ground there, but it's a little bizarre to me that they just will not find another city to put this series in. It is weird. Um, because, because on one hand, like cool, like I, you know, Vice City is probably my least favorite of the original, you know, PlayStation One, PlayStation Two trilogy. I mean, um, for me, it was Grand Theft Auto Three because it was it was just all concept and very little execution. Well, that's the thing. That was kind of my thing. Was um, I mean, Three was a was a revelation at the time. Obviously, it didn't age per- tremendously well, but like yeah. Vice City didn't change any of that. Like the Amy. That's true. Was there was still broken. problems. They it made it so fast. Like, it was just a reskin. It was yeah. literally a reskin, and like everybody freaked out because it had like neon stuff in it, and it had. I mean, like, they came out what two years later, or something like that. I don't think it was even that long. It was so fast. I mean, now they're taking we were still ten or eleven ex- years to make them. So. We were still on extended play when that happened. Yeah, um, that's true. Remember GTA? Yeah. I, GTA. I don't know if you. I don't think you were on extended play when GTA Three came out. Nope. Um, I was. A, I was a GameSpot. So so put it this way. Um, I mean, I was still new kid at, at, at extended play at that point because that was like what fall like September two thousand one, like fall two thousand one, earlier in two earlier in two thousand one, yeah. before nine eleven. That's right. Yeah, but I was I went I was hired full time there at like in like April two thousand one. I'd been a freelancer before that, and like I was the only one who knew GTA three was coming out. Oh really? And I was and I went because and when it came out, like no one cared, like no one gave a shit, like no one except like the hardcore people were talking about because GTA hadn't been an important series up to that point, right? But I'd seen like a magazine article or something about it, and like I think it might have been in um, Game Informer, and I was like, oh, this sounds really interesting. So I actually I remember I went down to uh, uh, what was that mall down like down south of San Francisco, like Saramonte, I think it was. I don't know. You know like, it was, you know, down like on the fi- on, the, on the 280. Like it was, it was like, it was like down near Colma. And I went down there because they're the only ones who had it. None of the stores in the city had it. So I drove down at lunch break and I went and, and got it from a game stop there. And I drove back, went to the game lab and put it in. And like, I was like, got three, GTA 3 and everyone's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> like the, and I put it well, in, I started playing it. And like a few PS people would filter in. You, you remember being in that lab and people would come in and out over the day. And some of you like, yeah. what the hell, what are you playing? What is this thing? And like, it would, and it got, you know, finally people were like, oh shit, this is amazing. And then we weren't allowed to do a review of it on the show because uh, the executive producer thought it was too violent. Yeah, I don't blame so, him. So I worked n- with Jeff Gerstman and Ryan Davis and they were obsessed with it. Mm-hmm. Ob- Sess. I don't know if I've. They were right ever, upstairs. You could ask them. I don't know if I've ever seen people be more into a video game than those two were into Grand Theft Auto Oop. Three. Um, it was crazy. Like it's all they wanted to talk about, all they wanted to play. So I, I knew very well it was coming before yeah. it came out. What? In um, hell? So Sorry, I pulled my headphones out. <laughs> so Matt, you seem to think that all these departures are going to be a good thing for Grand Theft Auto. I don't, Theft. I don't agree with that. I'm I think definitely Laszlo, worried. I think Laszlo's departure is a good thing. I think this is a natural turnover for the most part of old blood. Uh, the question becomes whether the new blood can handle the job. 
uh, but we don't know anything about what they're doing there with that. So, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the odds are that Rockstar can afford and can ferret out ter- talent that will do what they need them to do. Um, but I don't find people who have been on the job for 20, 25 years deciding that it's time to step away, uh, particularly alarming. Yeah, like, I think for in this case in particular, it's a little more of a big deal because, look, everyone. Aslo making- himself or some, one of the other people? All of them. Just the fact that and that many people leaving Grand Theft Auto is a bigger deal because of what Grand Theft Auto is, at least to me. Um, there are so many open world games, so many open world action adventure games at this point. Um, if you really look at Grand Theft Auto, does it really do the mechanics or the open world or the combat or any of that stuff better than other open world games? I don't think no. it does. And I think some people would argue in a lot of cases, the gunplay is worse. And some people mm-hmm. hate the driving. I actually like the driving in Grand Theft Auto, but I have heard a lot of people complain about it. So um, I, I think a lot of people would argue that uh, that Grand Theft Auto is, is what it is because of these X factors. And these X factors that people like, and maybe not specifically him, but people like Laszlo, people like Dan, people like Leslie Benzies, bring to the projects it's it's about the franchise's perspective on things and intelligently plucking the things that matter from whatever time period they're focusing on and finding the way to turn the screw on the stereotypes from that era and i feel like these guys were the guys who were doing that stuff and i just wonder if without that squad of people who are kind of sprinkling, they were like the Miyamoto. They're coming in sprinkling the special sauce and everything. I just wonder if the games are going to be the same. I just do. Um, I hope they're not. You hope I they hope, change. I hope they need they need to. Like these, they just it, sold like a hundred million copies. Well, I don't care about that. Like, yeah, because especially for your like, personal enjoyment of the franchise, I don't think. I don't think having better comedy and, and better writing uh, in terms of like not being written by a guy in his fifties who hasn't really paid attention to how the times have changed. Like, I don't think that's going to be a detriment to them. I don't think the you're going to sell fewer funny. It doesn't copies. matter how old the writer is or whatever. That, that, I don't think that's it's either funny or it isn't. Well, no, that's not true because funny age is the worst. And what one person thinks is funny might not be funny to a new generation. And I think we see that over and over today. Um, like you play, I mean, you can play old great comedies for a modern audience and they may or may not get it. Like try showing airplane to an 18 year old and they're not going to understand why you think it's funny. Like I'd it, actually it, like to watch like an 18 year old watch airplane. I think I that would, would be a really good show. Like sh- <laughs> showing like showing eight, like, 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 uh, Gen Z, like, old comedies would be really entertaining. It's a good YouTube show. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest. I mean, it would be a copyright strike to <laughs> hell and back, <laughs> but like it Absolutely. would be, I'm, you know, that probably does exist somewhere. Like, I mean, sure. I'm sure fine brothers. Someone saw it before somewhere. us. Yeah. But like, yeah, it's just, it's not the same thing. And some of it ages, some of it doesn't like, and, and it's, you know, it can be, you know, like blazing saddles is kind of the usual um, thing is brought up. But I do think that the Blazing Saddles example is sort of backward. And the people say like, oh, you couldn't make this movie now because like it's too war- wild and too raunchy and too racist. It's like, well, for, as Mel Brooks himself said, you wouldn't make that movie now because it was addressing problems, social problems and that are still around today, but they're not around today in the same way. They were way worse around then. Yeah. Um, or they're at least different. And yeah. so like, if you made a Blazing Saddles today, it would be very different jokes and very different approaches. So yeah. it's not that you couldn't make it; it's that you wouldn't make it. It's it, you know it, things things change and things have to be up, brought up to date. And you can end up in a situation where you have people that have been doing the same job long enough, especially in the realm of comedy, that just don't recognize that it's time for something new, a new approach to things. They just keep going at it the way they've always gone about it. Because look, your sense of humor doesn't really change that much over the years. And but sometimes you know the zeitgeist does. And I think maybe it's time for a world where GTA Six. Uh, approaches things in a satirical manner, but looks at it with younger eyes and maybe doesn't think that the joke about trans people is just that there are, in fact, trans people hanging around a bar. Like, that's not a joke. Bunk like, Go just wrote in chat and stop calling me Shirley. Yes, that too. <laughs> Great quote, man. <laughs> I, and, I honestly, and so I guess what we're saying to Rockstar is I just want you both to know good luck. We're all counting on you. <laughs> nice. Nice, Matt. And right now, they're, all the people in the chat, the jokes are just flying right, right over their heads. <laughs> <laughs> I do wonder. I think people would still find airplane funny. 
I hope Maybe. so. You'd have to explain a lot of stuff because air yeah. travel has changed so much. And like, just the, like, I remember watching it with a younger person once and I had to explain that like, yes, you used to just be able to walk to the gate. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that, and that there used to be people trying to, ago. there used to be people trying to sell you stuff in the terminal, like the scene where, yeah. where Robert Stack beats the hell out of all the Jehovah's well, people Witnesses. People who dropped you off at the airport could go to the gate yeah. with you. And wait oh, yeah. for you, you to get on your plane, and then they'd leave. Like, yeah, yeah there's a, there's a very, like just people walking through and like like going up and like you know walking right up to the plane. Like it's it was a whole different world, folks. It was. Um, so based on this information, Matt's actually it sounds like he's more excited for Grand Theft Auto Six. I think GTA has needed new blood for a couple of installments now, and um, uh, not. And I think you also agree with you that like the mechanics aren't the greatest. The open world is not the king of the open world. I mean, look, right, right, I've been playing Red Dead Online a bit the last week or two. Now that they fixed it, you know, well, you know they rolled back the last the year, they, ro- they rolled it. back it. Yes, yeah, <laughs> it still dis- it still disconnects all the time, which is ridiculous for a AAA online game all the time yeah. of, of this day and age. But like the, the world is amazing. I, I love the immersion of the world. And look yeah. at it. They do a sense of place better than it's probably anybody yeah. else, except maybe Ghost of Tsushima. Ghost of Tsushima is the good. only thing yeah. that's really yeah. struck me in like the same that league, in the same know? league, open world wise. But like. There's nothing to do, like, especially in GTA 5. Like, G- Red Dead Redemption 2 keeps you kind of going with the hunting and the fishing and the, like, there's, a, there's stuff to happen that happens around you. GTA 5, when I replayed it uh, on Next Gen, I was just struck by how little there was happening in the world. Yeah. Well, it's with. like a seven year old game now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, look, I, I'm concerned. I am absolutely concerned that that many people have left from the core GTA team. And I do think that they are the tastemakers and the people who really kind of made the franchise special. Now, do I think they can't find somebody else to do that? No, I, I think they absolutely can. And they may have been, you know, bringing someone up to handle this all along. So this, maybe this is all part of the plan. And the people who their apprentices were working under them all along and they're moving up into those roles now and it's all good. Uh, we'll never know that because Rockstar is so opaque. Mm-hmm. But I think the bottom line to me is that there's a lot of talent that, in my opinion, made Grand Theft Auto what it is versus just any other open world game. And now they're gone. And that's at least concerning to me. Um, I don't I don't find it concerning at all. Like, it's just it, even even if it's just to the point that, like, everybody knows what GTA is. Like you can find, you can, I can go to any game store and find five people that could write a fake GTA script for me. It wouldn't be necessarily be any good, but what That's GTA, what GTA is, is not a secret, not some kind of like esoteric weird thing. And I just think, I think it does need a little bit of revamping and I need, I think it needs some people that can admit that, Hey, maybe we don't want to hammer the fucking X button to run anymore. Like yeah. you know, whatever it takes. <laughs> there are very simple quality of life improvements they can make to that franchise. Yeah. And I'm assuming that stuff's going to happen, but we'll see. I wouldn't put it past Rockstar to just dig in his heels. Well, it's like the God. What was the other thing that was you know? Um, All these names we're seeing right now are not at the company anymore. <laughs> like remember, like Destiny. Like remember when the 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 inside stuff about the making of Destiny popped up, and everyone's like wondering like what the hell was wrong or Anthem as well. And they're they're like, oh, we weren't allowed to look at World of Warcraft. Yeah, for like existing MMOs to see how it should. You know, everyone was wondering why Destiny like was so far behind the curve on like how modern MMOs distributed loot or did like you know side quest stuff and everything. And they're like, oh, we 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 weren't allowed to use that knowledge to inform how the game was made. And it's just like Rockstar does that same thing. Rockstar does, yeah. does not use the advances in other games in that same similar genres to inform how a new game from them should work. And sometimes that's good because they know what they are and they know how things should be and they do it, you know, a certain way and it works that way. But sometimes it's like, Hey, we want to just click the stick to run. And they did finally put that in red dead too. (laughs) So someone woke up, but that should have happened three games ago. Or like, you know, that's all I'm saying is like, it's, it's, uh, I, I would like to see. They're stubborn. Yeah, I yeah, hear you. I, I'd like to feel see like they need to that, kick in the pants to actually make any changes. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. I'd like to. I'd like to see them kind of step into the current century in a way that, like, um, they just haven't so far. Yep. Uh, so anyway, there you go. That's the latest on Grand Theft Auto Six. Who knows when we'll learn more? It just seems to come just out of nowhere, just randomly. We get little tidbits about it. Um, but next time we get information, we'll share it because we know that it's obviously the biggest game in development right now. There's no disputing that. So yeah. you remember a few years ago when you you were like, "Oh, it's got to be almost done." Yeah, I, well, <laughs> like, it should have like, been. No. <laughs> it should have been years and years yeah. and years and years. Yeah, I, in fact, matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised if we got Vice City online before GTA Six. It's possible. 
Yeah. I mean, it's also possible, too, that they release them separately. And then, yeah. you know, kind of how they did last time. They released a campaign and then GTA Online came out afterwards. Who knows? It, Rockstar mm-hmm. lives in its own world and does its own thing. So, yep. And there still is there still aren't train robberies in Red Dead Online. They still got stuff to do on that too. I, I mean, I want, figured that was going to be the first thing you could do. That <laughs> seems kind of obvious, doesn't line. it? Yeah, that should be like the first mission. Like, like, how in the world are two things you can't do in Ro- Red Dead Online: rob trains and rob banks? <laughs> Those two things are not in the game. Because I'll say one thing: Rockstar is really good about milking like content. Yeah, to keep people engaged, so they keep coming back. Oh, we have this new heist mode. You can bet, rob rob bank mode. Like then everyone jumps back in again, gives them a bunch of money. It's yeah, self repeating cycle. So anyway, there you go. That's the latest on GTA Six. Next, we're gonna we already gave some airtime to Xbox Series X. It's only fair that we talk about the latest PlayStation Five stuff. Admittedly, there's not much because, as I said earlier, Sony's being real quiet. They're just letting Xbox kind of destroy itself right now, and the strategy seems to be working, so I can't blame them for that. Uh, But some new information did come out this week about PlayStation 5. Um, uh, Hardware-related, the console is going to have liquid metal cooling. Uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's crazy for a console. I've never had liquid cooling on my PC. Have you? Yeah, my my current one has has water Does cooling. It? Has water I've cooling. Does not have it. liquid metal cooling? No. Yeah, it's not liquid metal though. And they well, said the it's made I, out of like silver and copper. The yeah. liquid. Well, the thing I built, like it basically had to have it, or it wasn't going to work. Like it's because it's efficient. We, you know, it's, uh, so yeah, there's a liquid cooling system in the, in this thing. Um, never had a problem with it. It um, also says that they they've applied ultraviolet cured resin to the mm-hmm. heat sink in replace of the heat paste. Mm-hmm. Um, very, so very high tech. The, well, apparently the processor just burns through heat paste. That's yeah. how hot it was getting. And they had to find a way to cool it off. Um, mm-hmm. And so they it's I don't know if this is proprietary stuff. Um, I don't know. But I've never even had liquid cooling on my PC. Like, I always thought it was crazy. I'm like, really? You can have water around, like, electronics? Like, I always thought it was insane. The, the hoses are very thick. I it's, know, it's, I know. I mean, it's completely safe. But I would just always look at it and be like, that looks like a death waiting to happen. I don't know if that's a good idea. Um, but anyway, it's and look, it's not going to be like, there's going to be these liquid tubes running through the PS5 that you're going to be able to see. It's all going to be like internalized and compartmentalized inside the hardware. So, although it might leave at night to try to find John Connor, so <laughs> be true. ready for that. <laughs> that's true. Um, and then there's a couple other tidbits. Um, the DualSense controller battery. Uh, somebody got a hold of one and took one apart and looked at the battery inside, and it's at least fifty percent. It will last at least fifty percent longer than the DualShock Four based upon the rating of the battery inside it. And it's on SIF, and you can see a photo of the battery and all that. I can't remember what the moths were on it, but it's 50% longer lasting than the DualShock 4. And I would argue the DualShock 4's battery is pretty darn good. Yeah, I don't have a problem with the DualShock 4's battery life. Yeah, and so if I'm going to get another 50% on top of that, that's pretty cool. That's good to me. Um, And I would also say, too, the now that I've actually been using the the Elite controller that Sifters bought me for Christmas last year a lot more, that thing never needs charged. Like no, that's got ever. good life on it. It runs forever. I mean, not as much as the, the Switch Pro controller, which literally I think lasts like two months before I have to recharge it. But it's very good. Um, and so if you know if they can get the Dual Sense to anywhere near you know fifty percent mm-hmm. above Dual Shock Four, that's more than good enough. And the uh, like, I use rechargeable batteries in my Elite. Um, a, and like, yeah, I change them about once a month. Like, they're, yeah. it's very good. Really good. Yeah, I've been really impressed with it. That's one of the things I've been most impressed with, honestly, since I got it. Obviously, everything about it is better, but the battery life has been something that has really been noticeable for me. Um, and then finally, uh, we haven't really heard much from developers who have been working on PlayStation 5. And my guess is there's some kind of a gag order. Um, like, they just put out a gameplay trailer for NBA 2K21, which was, like, one of the first PlayStation 5 games ever shown and they showed current gen footage in the trailer. So there's obviously some kind of a gag order going on with developers and studios. It looks like Sony is trying to control all the PlayStation 5 footage that's out there. Um, but one of the developers working on Quantum Air said that uh, their game is running at 4K, 60 frames per second, natively, not even breaking a sweat. So 
PS5 looks like it is going to be a legit 4K native console. Um, and this isn't even one of the more skilled developers who are going to work on this. So imagine what a naughty dog or what well, we already saw what Insomniac's getting out of it, which is like mind blowing. So you have to wait a while to see what Naughty Dog gets out of it. Yep, a long while, I think, unfortunately. Other Aside than from like the pat, you know, the, the remaster of The Last, Last of, of Us two. Part Two and stuff like that. Yeah, but like a game built from scratch to the metal for PlayStation Five, we probably won't see that for two and a half, three years, is my guess from mm-hmm. Naughty Dog. Um, but look, even if it is a smaller developer, if they, with their limited resources, can get their game running at 4K native, 60 frames a second, that bodes very well for the bigger studios. So everything's coming up roses for the (laughs) PlayStation 5. It's really hard to find anything to complain about at this point. Can you think of anything? I'll complain about that Godfall demo. Yeah, Um, but I mean, that's just But in terms of of like, no, I mean, of the two, it's by far the more attractive option. And I'm not not gonna, I'm not gonna argue with Ray Traced Puddles either on uh, Miles Morales, which was funny. Yeah. um, After after all the puddle complaining. Um. Yeah, I mean, but they just haven't really made any mistakes with PlayStation Five so far. No, I mean, until we know the price, maybe. That yeah, might I mean, be like, the like, biggest mistake. Yeah, like wait for it, but uh, <laughs> which means that the whole console could have been a huge mistake if they can't get it to five hundred or less. Even five hundred, I think, is pushing it still. So, I mean, I kind of, I mean, I think five hundred is is the limit. Um, I do, I do kind of want to see what uh how sony would present 599 us dollars <laughs> without so saying whatever, that. How, how they would write a joke about it or something yeah. um but Dude, yeah it's I, really I hard to see doing that though yeah. i think it'll be 500 um but we'll see i mean you get i mean I've, I've got casual friends that have started to ask me where they can pre-order it yeah um, and I'm like, mm-hmm. like no, you you can't. nowhere yet. Like we don't yeah. know yet. And, and you I don't go, want to tell them because then you want to make sure you get one. It well, may be that tight. Well, I'm like, also like, they're, they're like, I'm like, they're like, well, let me know. I'm like, I will, but it might be gone by the time I know it. Like it's yeah. you know, like, like I mean, I'm, Sony I'm did say we will have, before I hook you up. <laughs> well, Sony did honest. say that there's that there you're going to have plenty of advanced warning when it's going to happen. Um, but who knows what that means? Yeah, but. So I'll tell you far. one thing, whenever, whenever they do their next state of play or their next presentation on something like that, I'm going to have that Amazon page open and ready Yeah, for whenever they shadow drop that shit. Yep. Um, between Sony's messaging and Microsoft shooting itself in the foot, I don't think the environment could be better for the PlayStation 5 than it currently is. Um, no, it's, a, it's a good time to be in Sony's marketing department, I think. I mean, the only lot to do. they made was, a, was showing the teraflops of the console. Mm-hmm. Um, knowing that it was going to be lower than Xbox and knowing that then they were going to have to explain why just because the number is smaller, it doesn't mean the console's weaker. Um, but, you know... But in the end, it didn't matter. Not a, right. It's not even a big mistake. Sony has just played this perfectly, um, and Microsoft needed to play it perfectly, and it hasn't. So, yeah. And in the end, the boring GDC presentation did not impact them negatively at all. No. As I said. Yeah, absolutely. It's, got, it's only going to matter how much that thing costs. Yeah, and that's really the last piece of the puzzle. That's all we have left: mm-hmm. release date and price. And I'm saying, the, I'm saying the release date is end of October. Um, I think they're going to come in before November. I think it's going to be the same day or same week as Watch Dogs Legion. Two months? You're saying in two months? Yep, I'm saying, I'm saying that this thing launches with Watch Dogs Legion, and that Xbox launches with Valhalla. Wow, that's my that's my bet. Okay, I'm, I could I could see that. I'm not going to agree to it, but mm-hmm. I think October is a little too early. But we'll see. I mean, because I mean, well, because Valhalla is like October 28th or something like that. Yeah, so it's very, very end of October. Okay. Uh, so anyway, that's the latest on PlayStation Five. Like I said, not a ton of updates, but every time they give us something new, we're going to make sure that we share it here on Game Face so that you guys don't miss a thing. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about Tony Hawk's Pro Skater One and Two Remaster. Uh, if you guys have been on Sifted, or even if you just follow things on social media, you probably know that there was a demo for this game that was released this week. Um, If you're wondering how you could get on the demo, you could either, well, there's really only one way. You could buy a burrito at Chipotle and hope that you're one of the first, like, X number of people to do it. Um, I was not going to be able to get to Chipotle, so I just emailed Activision, and they sent me a code. And so... Can you also get it if you pre-order the game? Yeah, pre-orders as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And the demo that went live last week and the one that I've been playing is just the warehouse. 
Um, and really, the probably, warehouse is all you need. Right. It, I mean, it is probably the most iconic of all Tony Hawk's Pro Skater yeah. levels. Because wasn't it? Wasn't that the demo on PS2 or PS1? PS1. As well? Yeah. Um, where like cause they did a demo because I remember they put a demo of that out from like official PlayStation magazine or something, and we just played that over and over and over and over and over and over for like a month. Yeah, and that's what people have been doing with this one. I didn't. I'll say this. I wore out on it pretty quickly because I did play it this yeah, way back when, like hundreds and hundreds of times. And it was cool to be able to jump in and like get back to my lines. I remember oh, yeah. kind like, of what my lines were. And I haven't played it, but I, I can imagine dropping back into some of those, some of those lines, those like, you know, established lines to police truck is going to be yep. feel pretty good. <laughs> now, that is my favorite Tony Hawk song of all time, mm. by the way. It's just freaking great. Dead Kennedy's police that truck. Is, that is definitely the one I associate the most with, with uh, Tony Hawk. It's great. Um, but they have full, and they do have four songs from the soundtrack in this demo. That is not one of them. Um, I do hope that it comes back. I think Jello Biafra will be okay with signing that song off. Yeah, I, again, you, you can't do it without that song. <laughs> you have to have it. I agree. Um, the demo was it itself, in the trailer. I thought that I think was it in the was. trailer. I think there was yeah. like a snippet of it, maybe in the trailer. Um, but that doesn't mean it'll be in the final game. There's different rights <laughs> for stuff like that. You just don't know. Um, so the demo is just the warehouse. I think there is another stage coming online either today or tomorrow. Um, so don't delete the demo. Um, they're going to start adding to it as time goes on. Um, but the way the warehouse works is you just have a free free run for two minutes, and then you can go over two minutes if you have a combo going, and it'll last until you finish the combo. Uh, then it'll tally up your points and end it. Um, as you complete it, you you earn money. And um, the money that you spend, then you can use those for upgrades. And if you do a really bad job um, on playing, you still get some money. Um, so even if you have a bad run, there's still some incentive to finish it off because that's the other thing that I remembered about this after playing it is that the, a lot of this game is deciding when to just say, oh, I need to restart. <laughs> hmm. Because it's like, it's all about points. And obviously the longer you string your combos together and the, the different number of tricks that you string into your combo is a big determinant on your combo score. But what I find myself doing a lot of times is I screw up a combo and then I just bail instead of just landing mm. the combo and letting the points add up. And I had forgotten about that whole kind of seesaw thing that you do while you play this game. Um, so probably the biggest change for this game, and I noticed it as well, is that some of is one you can pro you can program the tricks however you want. So you can you don't have to follow the commands that they've given you. Now, some people are going to do that because they have they have muscle memory related to these tricks. And I didn't change mine. But it was pretty cool to see that you could go in and pretty much customize the controls however you wanted. So you could set up like special tricks to make them easier to pull off, something that's more organic to how you play. Maybe there's like a move that you always do with the controller that you're good at and you want that to be, to be set to your special moves. Um, you could do that. You can basically set any move to any command that you want. Um, now, you still have to account for the time it takes to execute the move and make sure that you're, you fully rotated and landed and you get bonus points for landing correctly, I should add. Um, so do that as well. Make sure that when you're playing, you land perfectly with your wheel straight forward because you get like an extra multiplier, an extra thousand dollars when you do that. Um, so it's it's very much the same, but also very much different because it also has the the revert to manual, um, which is another way to boost your combos like crazy. Um, and I'm just I was in the habit of every time I came down on a ramp, tapping the shoulder to do the revert, and then quickly going down up so that you do a revert into a manual, and your points just go boosh. <laughs> and I had been in the habit of just doing that every time I came down. And I will say, Matt. I suck at this game now. Like huh. it took me a good hour for my muscle memory to come back to where I was able to actually like go all the way through my line, land my tricks. I still didn't peg manual or uh, revert to manual. I still don't have it down. Um, I got to the point where I could manual pretty much every time I landed, but getting the revert and the manual into it, I couldn't. Um, so there is some learning to be done with this game if you haven't played one for a long time, and I have not. Instead, I've been playing these hyper-realistic indie skateboarding sims, hmm. and playing this versus playing that, it's like night and day. Um, and I will say, I enjoy this game more. I know it's not realistic, 
Uh, I know it's absurd in a lot of ways. It to me is just more fun. And again, I'm a skater. I skated for a long period of my life. I just enjoy playing this more. It's fun. Uh, yeah, it's also I've always found that this series captured sort of the fantasy of what skateboarding should be like I, a lot better. I would also argue that when you skateboard in your mind, yeah. your mind is going like a billion miles an hour. It may look like everything's very slow as you're rolling up to a ledge, and you're getting ready to ollie onto the ledge and do your trick or whatever. But in your mind, your mind is just going and playing Tony Hawk's pro skater is how your brain feels while you're skateboarding. <laughs> and I definitely, it definitely took me a long time. In fact, the footage that you guys are seeing of the gameplay, it isn't even me. Like, um, I, there's this guy on GameSpot who is just incredible. Uh, and the very last clip in the B-roll is him finishing like a million point whatever run or whatever. Um, I never got good enough in the time I was playing it that I felt like you guys would want to watch the B-roll because I was falling over and over again. So it has taken quite a while for me to get back into it and to get good at it again. It does incorporate the double tap to change your grinds, which is huge. Uh, for those of you who like to do like four or five different grinds while you're grinding on that same rail, again, that's how you get big, big points in the game. And so they've instituted that. They've really included everything that I think real Tony Hawk fans would want in a game as far as how it's played. Um, the physics, there, there are some goofy moments still. Like this, what I've played, it still doesn't play quite as well as the stuff that we were getting from Neversoft. There's some weird moments where if you go off a ramp and then the game is expecting you to kind of transition down the spine and go down the same ramp, but instead if you fly over and land on the wall on the other side of the ramp, it gets a little awkward. It thinks you're like trying to do a lip trick. There's little goofy things about it that aren't quite ironed out yet, but the core gameplay feels great. And as my muscle memory started to return, I did start stringing together better combos. Um, I, I think the highest I scored on, on it was like 400,000 or something like that, um, but I didn't record that run. So anyway... Hmm. Um, I've had a lot of fun with it. I did burn out on it pretty quickly, though, because, again, I've played this stage so many times. So I'm pretty excited for the next one to come in. Um, other slight changes that I noticed, some of the trick names were changed um, from what they were in prior games. And I did some digging, and it looks like they went back and changed some of the trick names because since those games were released, those trick names have actually been changed because the person who actually created the tricks has finally been given credit for the tricks. Um, and it's this skater named uh, Chris Weddle. He's actually a deaf skateboarder, which blows my mind because skating, you do, believe it or not, you do rely on audio a lot. Um, as far as just hearing your tail when it hits, if it hit the edge of something, if it didn't, all that stuff matters. So it's amazing how good this guy is and he's deaf. But they've gone back. He was a pioneer in a lot of ways and they've given him credit for a lot of the tricks that he invented that he had not gotten credit for in the past. Um, the special meter returns to do your special tricks. You can literally fill up your special meter in like one combo. It's done. Mm -hmm. And then you can start pulling off your special tricks. But again, if you play the game in the past, you know that it's all about making sure you have enough air so you have enough time to do that full rotation for your special tricks so you can land them. So I guess in a lot of ways, I would say, based upon the stuff that I had read and we had talked about already, it pretty much was exactly mm -hmm. what I was hoping for. But it, that's feels, also, it feels better than the HD Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it plays and feels like Tony Hawk. Like, it, forget that HD thing that came out a few years ago. This is the real deal. I mean, they're also bringing in stages from both of the games. Like I said, they're already incorporating gameplay mechanics. Like, the manual came in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, and then I believe the revert came in 3. So and then, so then in three, you can start doing the revert manual, which allows you to link tricks mm -hmm. in between objects. So all that stuff, all the big paradigm shifts for the franchise are in here without the frivolities that kind of made the game and the franchise overbearing over time. Mm -hmm. um, it and, the, like and the trailer B-roll there does show the dead Kennedys on the soundtrack list. Oh, good. So. There we go. Win-win. <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed my time with it. I wished I could have kept playing the game, though, and moved on to the next stage and kept playing it that way. Um, but I did have a lot of fun with it, and I think this is the what the franchise should be going forward. Not that bloated Good. Tony Hawk's <laughs> underground crap that they... I mean, they just basically were like... I think what they did is they just developed themselves into a hole. They're like, yeah. we have to make improvements to this every year or people aren't going to be excited about it. 
but they after a while they found out they they ran out of relevant improvements to make and just started making these BS additions that made the game worse. So it's all been called back. There's there are no cinematics, there are no goofy stories. There, they've even brought in some of the the more modern skaters. Uh, Tony's son is in the game. Um, mm-hmm. Nigel Houston obviously is in it. Aubrey Bertoni, who is like the world's best female skater now, she's in there. Um, I definitely like that when it was a more of an arcade game better. Yeah, it, then that's exactly what this is. Yeah, because yeah. I just I you know, no offense one way or the other, but I don't give a shit about skater culture yeah. or nobody does. famous or any yeah. of that stuff. I just want to like play. Like to me, it was pretty much a platformer. It is, was it, you know. So like, I just wanted to do crazy tricks and do cool combos and and grind on things that no sane human would ever grind on and things like that. You know, crash through walls like that. Like, that's yeah, yeah. the kind of stuff that I liked about those the original games. Yep, me too. I'm right there with you. And again. As someone who does appreciate skate culture, I'd rather have this. Yeah. So they and were not like, doing a good job of tackling the skate culture angle anyway is, mm-hmm. the, is the problem, really. It's just it's like how I would prefer to play NBA Jam yeah. than NBA 2K. I get it. Like I, I like the fantasy. I like the, 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 the ridiculous over-the-top idea of, of, of this kind of stuff more than like simulating it. So. Yeah. And I understand why people love skate so much and like kind of the, you know, the simulations of, of real sports and stuff, but... I am more interested in sort of the being sold the lie on, on these kind of things. The same way I like, I like, you know, sports movies. It's like what most sports movies are not, they're not real depictions of yeah. anything, but I like that. Like, you know, the feeling they give you. Yep. <clears throat> Absolutely. This game feels good. Plays well, a couple little quirks here and there with the physics, but it's not a deal breaker and it's definitely not anything like the HD remake for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the big question. A lot of people have. Yeah. Is, oh, like, it's they do better this time. It's better. Oh yes. Way. Just way watching better. it. You can tell, you can tell, you can just see it, just how fast it is. Like you yeah. can just tell that it's, it's the OG Tony Hawk stuff, but brought to a modern age and kind of a, a compromise between the original games and the older ones. I think they've hit the sweet spot. And I think if you're an old fan mm-hmm. of Tony Hawk, you're going to love it. Well, I'm definitely going to get it because yep. uh, one and two were my favorites. So they, it's, uh, it's, they've done a good it. job on it, man. I'm impressed. And going back to what you're saying about skate culture and how I said that they didn't get it, the reason they didn't get it is because Neversoft weren't skaters. Like, they just weren't. They were cool guys, and I really liked going to Neversoft. Like, every year for Tony Hawk, I would go to Neversoft. We'd hang out with the team. We'd talk to Tony Hawk. We'd talk to a couple other skaters, Rodney Mullen or whatever. And we just basically hang out there all day. And I got to know the Neversoft guys really well, and they are really good dudes, really cool guys. But, like, none of them skated. Um, they had been making the games long enough that they knew enough about skating to talk about it. But there's a big difference between that and actually skating um, and being a part of the culture and going out every day with your friends and actually trying to find places to skate and getting thrown out. All that stuff ties into the culture of it, and they just didn't quite get it. So I'm glad to see it removed for this game. Uh, Okay, it's time to move on. We're going to talk about Metroid Prime 4 again. (laughs) Uh, That's all we're going to do about Metroid Prime 4 for a very long time. Let's talk about it for a... Well, actually, I don't think we'll talk about it again for a really long time because we got some really, really, really bad news about Metroid Prime 4 this week. Retro is just now hiring the lead producer of Metroid Prime 4. Well, they had a lead producer that left at the end of 2019. So they're replacing replacing the lead producer, but it's interesting that it took like eight months. Yes, uh, for them to try. Even. I mean, they just put the ad out. They haven't even actually replaced it yet. They just put out the ad for the position. It's also weird to just... It just seems weird that they would even put an ad for that job. I'm glad that they do that stuff because that's how we get most of the leaks and information. But I mean, sometimes you legally have to, depending on what state you're in. Yeah, you're like right. You, you have to. That's true. And they're publicly, in Seattle, so yeah. you're probably right. They probably legally had to post the job. Although I'm guessing they won't even look at the applications that come. No, they probably already know who they want. But <laughs> they you may have even to have hired the, the person already, actually. Yeah. But um, you have to put a listing up publicly yeah. to pretend that other people had a shot. <laughs> <That's-> <laughs> so what does this tell you? One, that the lead producer left at the end of last year. And two, that it took eight months for him to replace them. And three, the fact that they're just getting a lead producer now. Mm-hmm. I like that lower third, but I would have said it ran so far away. <laughs> I, it wouldn't fit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I thought about that one, but I was like, I'll just shorten it. <laughs> Can't resist a flock of seagulls Metroid joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what does this all tell you, Matt? 
Tells me I was right. This game is a long, long way away. Like it's a Switch Two game now. Yeah, it's not much, coming yeah. to Switch. Like Probably it's not. just not. Um, it may be a hybrid game, but I think if, if it is, the Switch will be long forgotten by the time it is the hybrid game. I mean, I think you're looking at 2023. Like if you're yeah. lucky. That I think clearly we'll, the project is happening. It's is in process. Um, I don't think they're not started or anything. But like, because a lead producer on this would be more of a kind of like on, keep on target scheduling kind of thing. I yeah. think um, hitting the, hitting and, milestones, and yeah. you can and you can get work done before that's in place. But if you want to actually get anything finished, that's what that lead producer needs to do. Um, so I'd say we're we're and knowing the Nintendo sort of like you know you got to make it good before you put it out because you know the the, the Miyamoto uh, uh, saying about delayed games being good and rushed games always being bad. Um, I feel like you're looking at three years. No, oh. <laughs> that's brutal. Why did Ho- they hopefully they put that metro so early? <laughs> it's crazy. I, well, remember they started over. Like they, you know, they originally had it given to what was it? Uh, uh, was it Namco? Yeah, somebody, Namco they, they had originally started yeah, working on it, yeah. and then they decided it wasn't working, and they started over and gave it to Retro. Um, so clearly they thought this was going to be done sooner because they had you know contracted it out to a different group and then decided it needed to be brought home to Jesus. Um, In hindsight, a huge mistake. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you probably want to make sure that the, that the concept is approved before you go in and out. But again, at that time, I mean, all they did was show a logo and yeah. it was basically just to say like, yeah, we hear you. There's more coming because that was after they'd blown their Mario Zelda wad and had to kind of prove that there were more big guns on the horizon. But uh, ironically, like, a Metroid's not even that big of a gun outside of the the core I know, like, it hardcore even people. Sell that well. And like B, this thing is way way out there. Like we're probably gonna you know, maybe Metroid trilogy, a Prime trilogy collection will show up at some point, like next and year or something. Next year, and maybe we'll you know hopefully we'll get that Mercury Steam Metroid game yeah you know, at some point. We're gonna probably have gone through a couple of Metroids before this shows up. So don't it's don't, crazy. Don't expect to be playing Metroid Prime Four for pro- probably on this. I mean, I bet it will be available on the Switch. I think the, the Switch Two will do a a hybrid thing, sort of like what the PS4 and PS5 are doing. But uh, I would not would not be surprised if it wasn't more of a launch window Switch Two game. Now, why do you what do you take away from the lead producer leaving the project? Uh, I there's no because we did we kind of blew it off with Halo Infinite and look now. Yeah, but there's no way to know. I mean, they, they could be leaving for life reasons. They could be, you know, having them move yeah. across country to take care of a sick parent. Like you don't, you can't yeah. speculate on that. Like it doesn't mean anything one way or the other. It can mean something for the project, but it doesn't mean that the person left because there was a reason to leave. Um, unless you want to track that person down and ask them about it, um, which is valid. Uh, Patrick Clapp. What are you seems, doing? <laughs> it just seems weird that anyone would leave a Metroid Prime project. I don't know. I mean, it's it's uh, it can't be easy. And like I, my my main thing with a Metroid Prime Four project that I would assume, having no knowledge of the inside workings of this, is like you got to be under, especially after you had to cancel it and start it over once. The scrutiny they must be under from the home office at Nintendo must be incredible. Like I can see someone just not wanting to deal with that kind of pressure for the next two to three years. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. If you could find another gig somewhere that paid just as well, yeah, maybe you realize, re- oh, yeah. this isn't coming for three years, and you're like, oh my god, then you're gonna have to be, fans are gonna hate me. You're gonna be having like <laughs> semi quarterly like Miyamoto inspections for the next three years. Like, that's not gonna do wonders <laughs> for your blood pressure, folks. Like, yeah. so I don't know if that's any kind of realistic <laughs> depiction of what's happening there, but like, it's just too many variables to just decide one way or the other what that means. The main thing is like, like. <sighs> It's very hard to understand what you feel like you've got the template of this thing yeah. down. Like, yeah, what, you're not reinventing the wheel, I'm assuming. Like, or at least you shouldn't have to because, like, you, you know, shouldn't because it's, it's good. Right. <laughs> and so, like, I, I wonder what the what the controversy internally is. Like, what what's know. the problem? Like, why? That's why I'm wondering. That's what I'm wondering about. And, and part of it may come down to Nintendo's, Nintendo's like reluctance to just sort of like fire out another sequel that's just like the last one. Um, and that can be a strength or a weakness with Nintendo because sometimes I just want another fucking game. Like yeah. sometimes you can just make Metroid again, guys. Yeah, like, and I'm cool okay. with it. Give me a different story and I'm okay. Like you don't have to completely yeah. flip it on its head. And yeah. sometimes it's like, oh, we should expand this. We should change this. We should do something more interesting with it. And then it turns out really well. I don't know if you really need to invent the Metroid Prime wheel. 
Yeah, they um, don't need to do that with Pikmin either, by the way. It's no, like, just make no, they this, don't. get Pikmin 4 out. Like, I, I don't know what you're doing. Just put out another freaking Pikmin game. Make Pikmin. All right, yeah, I mean, seriously. I guess we're getting Pikmin 3 again, but... Yeah, they're, re, they're redoing uh, the Switch. I mean, cool. Uh, I mean, cool. Like, yeah. Pikmin 3, it was good. It shouldn't be trapped on the Wii U. Um, you know, the, the, the Pikmin, Pikmin 3 on Wii U was very expensive for a long time because it was out of print. So, yeah. like, yeah, bring everything worthwhile on the Wii U forward to the Switch. Great. Love it. Um... But please get out. Pikmin Four There's done. Nothing like, left. Somewhere in here, like <laughs> really running out. I mean, you need, basically the the the, rem- the you know the HD remasters we don't have yet for the Zelda games and the um, 3D, 3D World Mario. and uh, Xenoblade Chronicles X. Those are those are the remaining major Wii U th- and Fatal Frame. But I don't think we're getting that. No, Super Mario 3D World. I think is a given though. Yeah, Fatal Frame. I think was too tied to the gamepad. Yep. Hey, yeah. that guy B Solo. Thank you for Twitch Prime, man. We appreciate it. Makes a difference for us. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't go 2023. I would say best case scenario, Q1, 2022, worst case scenario, fall 2022. That's still two and a half years from now. Very optimistic. I think (laughs) because I'm not saying it takes that long to make that game, but I am saying it takes that long to make that game and make it with Nintendo's nitpicky input. That's possible. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like this is going to be a protracted development process because Nintendo is going to have these opinions on things. It's possible. And you're going to have to sort of take a few steps back and go back the other direction. I, I feel like it's going to be a star, stop and go project. You know what I mean? You would um, think that they would just trust Retro at this point, but the over, the turnover there has been awful too. Right? It's like how can the people there haven't put a game out in yeah. years? You know, like it's and uh, they've been ports. Like they just been yeah, making other people's games. You so. can't sit there and judge what they could do for Metroid Prime Four off of Tropical Freeze. Nope, definitely not. It's not no. even the Tropical Freeze. The remaster of Tropical Freeze. They haven't put out a new game in forever. It's That's just the Wii U. Time. Yep. Yep. So. And it looks like it's going to be quite a while longer yeah. until they put something out, unfortunately. So there you go. That's the latest update on Metroid Prime 4. I'm sorry. It's not very encouraging. It's really not encouraging at all, to be perfectly honest with you. No. I would but... not count on this game coming to Switch, or if it does at the very end of its life cycle, maybe they release it for both Switch and the next then Switch 2 or whatever the heck they end up calling it. But if you're holding your breath waiting for this game to come and save the next like year and a half of, of empty Switch release calendar it's yeah not this one maybe maybe uh maybe a uh, Mercury steam maybe Mercury steam three thing. like we're still Bayonetta waiting for three, that i would think <laughs> then quite a while shin megami tensei finally poked its yeah, head up yeah we're finally so. gonna get that it's i don't know the last couple years of switch are not looking like they're gonna be great but they also don't look like they're gonna be as bad as the wii u or even the wii for that matter so gotta take what we can get at least it's better that's for sure mm-hmm. uh Next up, I was talking earlier about PC players, and we had a topic about PC players. And this week, a very... Oh, wait. Before we do the uh, Nintendo, go away from Nintendo. Oh, yeah. I'll we forgot to, to open the show by showing this off. So, Matt... The Lego NES TV. Matt has the Lego NES. He's put it together, and look, he's cranking the handle, and there goes Mario up and over the platforms. Yeah. <laughs> So now that you've put it all together Nate. and you've played with it, was it worth it? Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty cool display piece and the, the build is very interesting. Um, it actually hurt my fingers because the, I don't know if you can tell, but the, um, the, game, the game screen... Every single thing there is like a one square piece almost oh, on the yeah, bottom. And then, you, and, then you, yeah. and then you put uh, cover ones over it. So there was a lot of handling of tiny little things that were too small for my large adult hands, but we got done. Yeah, that's and, pretty um, awesome, man. Let's see the console. console. Oh, lost the, lost the controller. The console is here. It's cool, man. It's a little, it's a little smaller than the real one. Yeah, but it's it got a working open. hatch. <laughs> and you can it uh, comes the game. You can actually put the actually put the game in. It it goes down and closes now what. Up. Does that is that a real game? Can you put real carts in there no. and they fit? No. No, it's too big. It's too small. Okay. Gotcha. Um and you've got uh I mean it's very you got the <laughs> audio cool. and video out, you got the power stuff on the back. <laughs> That's you got awesome. the little thing for where the power cord, cord came out. Yeah. Um yeah, it's it's very, very detailed and very impressive. They did like a good it, job on it for sure. There's like this whole thing here, they got that. Yeah. 
the, it's it's super accurate. They so, nailed I mean, it. I mean, Lego is is like that. So not hugely surprising. We get the controller. Did it out. break apart? No, just one piece came off. So that's that. It doesn't actually move, but uh, it is no. life. It is life size. This one is that is the size. actual right size. Yeah, yeah. it's cool. So, oh, on the back there, you can see the Lego is the yeah, Lego the back is. Yeah, the back is is uh, gives it away. Yeah, pretty and cool. They even they even have the the plug. <laughs> yeah, that crazy plug. So, are you happy that you bought it? Yeah, I like it. I mean, I don't think I'd ever want to do it again. Uh, it, it's a long build and it's uh, a little tedious in places. But I'm glad I did it. Like eventually, I might get tired of having it on my table and give it away or get rid of it someday. Yeah. But for now, I'm happy I have it. Now I got to think about getting the uh, grand piano. Oh, there's a grand piano. There's a grand piano they put out the same day as that actually, and it's uh, it's a little. It's like it's like Barbie size. Oh, okay. Uh, grand piano. Okay. But how much uh, is that? Three fifty, I think. Does it but work? It does. It's oh, uh, man. so like all the key. You press the keys, and I mean, there's no strings in it, but you press the keys, and a little hammer comes down in the in the back. You can see it, and then you can link. You can sync it with a an app on your phone, and play stuff on the on the keyboard, and it'll make sound on the phone. And you can also have the phone, I believe, make it play like songs, like in like a player piano kind of thing. Huh. I, I might be wrong about that part, but I do know that you can hook it up and pretend it's like a toy piano. Like with, your, with an app that's happening with a lot of stuff. So like that, this TV does have an interactive thing with uh, the Mario figures that come with the other Mario sets. I have not opened the starter Mario set yet. Um, so I don't, I haven't tried that, but the, the Mario figures are digital and the face changes and oh. he reacts to things. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. They're pretty so cool. Can, so you can put it on top of that TV. And as it, as you crank the thing, he makes sound effects that uh, fit with what's happening on the screen. And reacts to like what's happening. <laughs> it's a lot different than making a dinosaur when I was. Yeah. A kid. <laughs> well, the weirdest thing about the Mario stuff is that they don't have instruction manuals. They have they have an app. They're like just figure you, it out. No, yeah. they have an app, and you get digital instructions oh, on, on the like app to even on your build phone. It. Yeah. So like, oh, that, that's like that's bad. the one of the things now is like is like there's no paper instructions. You, 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 the kids want to use their phones. They don't want paper instructions. I want paper. <laughs> well, this, so this did come with paper instructions. Oh, it, it did. Came, it came with actually a, an instruction manual thick enough to stun a burglar. So it's uh, <laughs> it's a it's double double. Which useful. you may end up needing before it's all said and done with your experience at your crib. That <laughs> eh, was months ago. <laughs> you already scared them off. They're not coming back. So anyway, uh, time to move on. We're going to talk next about some interesting data that was released about PC gamers and players this week. Um, I was shocked on both data points. So the first one that shocked me was that PC players make up 48% of all gamers in the world. So roughly half of all gamers on planet Earth are PC gamers primarily. Um, that to me was a shock. Um, not that it was the most popular, but it was that it was the most popular by that much. It won in a landslide. It's not even close. Um, and then the other part of it is that despite PC gaming making up half of the market as far as consumers are concerned, it only comprises 25% of the revenue generated by the industry. And this data mm -hmm. is coming from DFC Intelligence. They are a reputable uh, data farming firm, and typically their numbers are accurate. Um, why do you think that is, Matt? Why, do, why does the PC have half of the audience, but only 25% of the revenue? Piracy. Is pi you think it's piracy? That's what uh, everyone who works in games would tell you. Yeah, yeah. Like that, you know, the developers, at least I know that is their whole thing. Like the 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 rule of thumb is, whatever you sell on consoles, you will sell one tenth that on PC, uh, and largely they blame that on the ease of piracy. I definitely think that's a part of it for sure, um, with without a doubt. But I also wonder if another. If you're part also talking it, revenue, it might just be because PC players wait until sales are in play. Okay, that's and a third been, angle and, that I hadn't thought and of. And know that, you know, Steam sales kind of, you know, were the pioneer of like ultra low discounted, uh, you know, big games that you yeah, could get. I mean, oh, it's like, oh, you wait. Sale was the first. Yeah, you yeah. wait a year and you get a game that's 60 bucks a year ago for like 30 or 20 or sometimes 15, um, depending on how successful it was. Like, that's a good incentive to wait around. And so that's going to lower the revenue totals of PC gaming just because people, you know, I know plenty of people who play only on PC who will never buy a $60 game. 
Because they know if they wait a few months, they can at least get it for 40. Or if they go to like Green Man Gaming or whatever, they can get it for cheaper at launch or whatever. You know, there's a lot of effort put into not paying full price uh, in the PC gaming circles because you don't have to, really. Even if you're not pirating, even if you're not pirating, you can find a good deal on almost anything. And then I actually had had a third idea, and it, I think it just might be just the games that are popular on PC. Like, I play my PC a lot, but I don't spend a dime on PC games because I play, That's like, true. League of Legends or I play Dota, all these free-to-play games that you can literally play forever. Or, look, a lot of people get into StarCraft. You buy StarCraft. You can play Star StarCraft for the next... Well, heck now, what has it been, 12 years or something? I mean, PC gaming is different in that way, in that you can buy one game and you can really stick with it for a really, really long time and have it still be rewarding. You're not just retreading the same stuff over and over, doing the same things over and over again. Um, So I think you're right, Matt. I think it's a function of all three of those things. It's piracy. It's the fact that games tend to go on sale a lot earlier on PC than they do on other platforms. And three, the games that are just popular on Mm -hmm. the PC, RTS games. Like if they have a multiplayer mode, you can play that forever. You don't have to buy another game. Or even like online, you know, like MMOs or whatever. Like there's plenty of people I know who play one game, you know, they play Overwatch all the time and never buy any of the loot boxes and never do any, you know, but that's what they play. Or they play free to you know League of Legends every once in a while to buy skins or whatever. I've been playing League of Legends for like seven years. I've I w- I've never spent a penny. I've never given Riot a penny. Mm-hmm. I I feel actually feel bad about it when I even a it. even a subscription based game. You're only spending fifteen bucks a month usually. Yeah, I mean, again, hearing me say it out loud, I do feel bad about it. So maybe I'll go <laughs> buy like a, a Timo skin or something um, because I should give them some money. I mean, I've been playing that game for forever. And I, I don't know how many hours I've spent playing League of, but that's the point is, is I've been playing that game for years, for hundreds and hundreds of hours, and they've never got a penny from me for it. So mm-hmm. that's, I think there are a lot of games on PC that are that way, and I think that's also skewing the numbers in that direction. Um, but still, it's still surprising to me, only 25% of revenue. Uh, the other thing that was crazy about this was they said that like console gaming made up like 10% of revenue. I was mm-hmm. like, what? <laughs> like, and again, this is a worldwide. And it's interesting when you start looking at data worldwide versus just America or versus just Europe or versus just, just Japan. That's when, when you start getting into Eastern Europe and a lot of those places, that's where PC just reigns supreme. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I would argue that's where a lot of piracy reigns supreme too. So you have a big user, in e- a lot of users in Eastern Europe that are also pirating software on a pretty regular basis and that's a recipe for a lot of publishers not wanting to release games for pc i mean let's just be honest um i think it's become so easy now though Mm -hmm. i mean you're seeing it with playstation if sony is going to port a playstation exclusive to pc that's when you know cross-platform development has become very very easy and I think well, they, are, they already had the engine in place and then they didn't even do it very well. So right. I don't know about that, but I think you just, you know, most of the developers I know just sort of accept that you're going to lose some stuff to piracy on PC. You're not going to, it's not going to be a lead sales skew, but like you basically have to do it or you're going to get yelled at forever. And yeah. uh, that's just sort of part of the, it's part of the bargain essentially. Um, and then, and then the PC, PC game versions have increasingly been used as bases for remasters on later consoles. So they, that's do, true. they do provide benefits later. That's true. That's a good point, actually. Um, what do you think the PC industry needs to do to squeeze more money out of all these people? I mean, look, I'm not the only one who's skating by here without spending mm-hmm. much money. A lot most people are. I mean, I don't know what else there is to do, really. Yeah, because it's like every time they've tried to do anti-piracy, it's been a disaster. Mm-hmm. Like, like I hate piracy. That is, though, why they keep trying all those anti-piracy things that you look at and you're like, why would you ever attempt something that's stupid? Because they're desperate to find a solution to it. Yeah, I mean... And I don't I, think there is one, really. I don't know if there is. Like, I hate piracy, too. But the anti-piracy measures they've taken are so abysmal that I can't support them. It's like, you know what? If, I, if that's what it's going to take, then maybe games should be pirated. Like, I... Don't know what that answer is, to be honest with you. Yeah, I don't. I can't blame some people I know who are like, "Look, I'll buy the game." I, I know some people, you know, working they're working in the industry, so they're a little more conscientious about it. But they're like, "Yeah, I bought the game, but then I downloaded the pirate version because I didn't want to put that 
copyright the DRM on my machine. On my machine. So <laughs> and technically that's legal. Yeah, they pay, paid for it, paid, paid in full, and then they downloaded the uh, the cracked version because they didn't. Yeah, yeah, it's totally legal. So it, it would hold up, but uh, it's ridiculous that you would you know you feel the need to do that. Like it's it's very you know I know that like there's got to be some you know, there's, there's got to be some way to sort of like stop it. People always think or like the people in the industry think, yeah. but it's just like I just you're never going to get around it. Like there's always going to be as long as you're on an open system the way a PC is. It's just part of it. The, the only way to combat it is the way that like Apple combated uh, music piracy, which is you just make it easier and to so buy cheap. it legitimately than it is to pirate it. And yeah. that's the, that's really the most effective tool you have. And I do see the argument that like Epic is sort of throwing a monkey wrench in that to some degree because everybody considered Steam to sort of be the solution to how easy it was to buy games and buy them cheaply. And here comes the Epic Game Store sort of like, messing around with things and da, da 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 but like you know that's also sort of part of the thing it's like if you can just download it for free or whatever as the weekly free game on epic game store that also combats piracy to some degree yeah it definitely does um so you know the other option would be change how you're designing games so that you're squeezing more money out of them but the crazy part is that i feel like games pc games as well have become more generous to players over the last couple of years like they're not inching towards this place where they can get more money out of the consumer. They're actually being more consumer friendly than they've ever been. Um, I guess there's just so many people that are buying skins on games like League that it's not a big deal. You got the scale there. I just wonder for these smaller PC games, if they don't have some kind of a deal with Epic Game Store like uh, Total War Troy just did. And now... 7 million people have the new Total War game because it was given away for free. And now, you know, maybe on down the road, they can leverage that audience to make money off a of DLC and stuff like that. You know, they're not doing that, but that may be what they need to start doing to increase revenue because I just, it's hard for me to see how a lot of these developers and publishers are making any money off of PC only games. I just, these smaller indie studios, and I, maybe that's why. They all end up coming to console now. Yeah, but. that is why. Like, there's, there's a, you know, you start on PC and you want to get a console deal because you're going to sell ten times more copies if you, if you happen to get any kind of decent promotion. That was the appeal of the Switch for a while before they turned the the eShop into a giant shovelware landfill. Um, you know, or you get people that did like indie games that we knew about. You know, we were familiar with these games, but they're like, yeah, we just sold three hundred percent in the first week of what we did on PC in like two months, you know, it's like, yeah. and that's, that's, so that's a reality. That's just, you know, that's just, even if console sales really do make up only about 10%, um, when it comes to these sort of like, you know, self-contained full games, um, there's a big difference there. You know, even you know, people making, you know, you're making some big multi-platform thing. You're going to assume that if you sell a hundred thousand on PC, you're going to sell a million on, on each console. Yeah. So, and that's a big difference in scale. You don't want to throw away those 100,000 sales, obviously. Uh, it justifies the existence of a PC version, but it's not where the money's made. Yeah, and it's also interesting that generally, you're right, most games are built first per, for PC, knowing that they're probably not going to make any money, but you need that base version built on the PC to then help port that game out to all these other versions. So, I, don't, I guess it's a necessary evil at this point, but it's hard to imagine that any developer could survive on PC alone today. I mean, so I mean, Creative Assembly does, like Total War, you mentioned. Um, hmm. <laughs> exactly. I mean, tons of weird, little, tons of little indie things. Obviously, they, yeah, they carve out their own niche, but don't cost much to begin. Even with. Blizzard now is, you know, yeah, Blizzard's pretty solidly multi-platform at this point. Yeah. There um, certainly Diablo there. 3 has done very well for them on consoles, yeah. certainly in comparison to PC. Yep, absolutely. Um, even the stuff that we would have originally considered like very specifically uh, PC only, like the Pillars of Eternity games or Pathfinder Kingmaker, which came out yesterday. Yeah. Um, things that would all, you know, in the past would have been completely relegated Never to PC Never would have only. left PC. Now they're all getting, con you know, I have, I have that and, and, um, and Pillars of Eternity and Torment. And, uh, and yeah. Div Divine Divinity, uh, original sin, Divinity Original Sin, and those like I have all those on my Xbox. And um, granted, I paid like fifteen dollars for them in sales a year after they came out, but like they're, they're you know I have all of those on X on console now, and they're all yep. playable, which is not a thing I really thought I'd ever see. 
or all yeah. those Baldur's Gate, the enhanced editions of those. Like stuff comes to console now that we, as long as it's not like a real time strategy game, you're probably going to see it on console at some point. Yep. Even RTS. I mean, we're going to get Halo coming up here on consoles for, you know, I think it's December, November, December. Now that they did release it on PC first, and we've already played it on PC, but it's still coming to Xbox. So what? Halo 2, Halo Wars 2? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I already have that through Game Pass. Yeah, I mean, but, I played the uh, PC version already and finished it, except for the final boss, who I still have never beat. Hmm. I still can't beat him. I don't know what I got to do. I got sick of it. I like had a mid-battle save, and I didn't want to go back and start the battle over again. Yeah, that's, and that's unusual. I mean, like, remember when Battle for Middle Earth 2 thought they figured out RTSs on console? Yeah. And then just, like, nobody ever tried it again? No. Yeah, no. I mean, Pikmin's kind of RTS on console. A little That's bit, yeah. Kind of figuring it out, I guess. But but otherwise, yeah, they're very uncommon. That is still one genre that predominantly stays on PC. Yeah, but you're, like, you're probably not going to see an Xbox version of Total War no. anytime soon. Nope. Unless they release a mouse and keyboard for it. And then that's mm -hmm. very possible. And I wouldn't be surprised if they do because you basically are just buying a really freaking powerful PC. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some people buy like an Xbox Series X and just use it as a PC tower. Yeah, I mean, let's you, be honest. Put in keyboard uh, and, and mouse sensing. You know, uh, Microsoft has been uh, resistant to that in the past. Yeah, they, I mean, look, you want... can't run Windows on it or anything like that, but you can use it as an entertainment center and have mm -hmm. your keyboard and mouse there to, to operate it still. So it'll be interesting because the lines between consoles and PC have never been blurrier, ever. And they're just going to continue to get blurrier, I believe. So... There you go. The weird idiosyncrasies of PC gaming. There's a lot of them, but they don't generate a ton of cash for the industry. But it is what it is. It's not their fault. I mean, if they're not going to figure out a way to handle anti-piracy in a consumer-friendly way, people are going to rebel, and I'm not going to blame them for it. That's just the way it is. So, All right. Next, we're going to talk about The Legend of Zelda. And what I believe, maybe I'm wrong, but what I believe most people think is the worst 3D Zelda ever made. And that is The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, originally released for the Wii, um, and pretty much driven by motion controls for the most part, like most first-party Wii games. And I think for that reason is mostly why people do not like this game, the motion controls. And the big news is, is that another retailer leak has revealed that it appears Skyward Sword is also going to be brought to the Switch. Um, now, I'll just say, these retailer leaks have been like 95 to 100% accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, there's very little reason for a retail company to create a listing for nothing, unless there's just some huge gamer that's working there that's trying to troll people like us. And which is why 95% of the time they end up being right. Uh, looking at the Switch release schedule, at least the first party release schedule, would also lead you to believe that this makes perfect sense because Nintendo needs games to release. Mm -hmm. So, Although I don't know why you wouldn't just put the frickin' Twilight Princess and Wind Waker HDs on, on the Switch instead because wow, would I rather buy those? I would rather buy either one of those games over Skyward Sword. However, there could be an argument made that there might be more demand for Skyward Sword as far as sales are concerned because it hasn't been remade. And if they actually do put some work into this, because you can play it at 720p if you have the component cables, blah, blah, blah. But like if they actually put it, like mix, mix it up a little bit, change the game a little bit, and up-res it to 1080p, then maybe you might have something. And I think maybe most importantly, if they remove the motion controls. Do you think that's a given, Matt? I mean, I don't know if that's a given. I do think it's it would help, but it doesn't solve the problem. Because um, I do think even if you take out the motion controls, I think this is the weakest 3D Zelda by far. Like, it's the the everything is just incredibly uninspired in it. I I even when I finally got my head around the, the motion controls and was came to terms with that, I just hated playing this game and I never finished it. Um, I so, did. I reviewed it. And I gave it like, I, th I can't remember the exact score, but I gave it a score lower than everybody else. And I heard it for I remember like that. I remember a month that. and a half 
I heard it. I heard it in on the X Play team. Like, oh my god, game trailers gave it this. I'm like, yeah, because it blows. And everyone's like, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. you know, there's that thing where like you can't criticize a Zelda game for the first yeah. three to four months of after it comes out. And like after I a did. while, people finally were like, okay, yeah, <laughs> Skyward Sword wasn't very good. Yeah, you know, of course I, not. look, I still gave it like an eight point something, but everybody else was giving it like nines and almost ridiculous. tens. Ridiculous. I think it was an eight five. I can't remember. But I mean, I it's it, not the wor- it's not the worst Zelda game. Uh, the, the, I mean, it's still de- a decent game. Just it's when you talk about 3D Zelda games, the bar is so freaking yeah, high that if it's anything lead. less I mean, than stellar, it's not. It's going to be. I mean, deep. obviously, I would rather play this than like Sky uh, or um, Phantom Hourglass or Spirit yeah. Tracks. Yeah. But like, it's just especially because I think it looks really good. I really like the visual style. Do you like the, the day glow kind of color palette? Yeah, I like the. I like the. I think it's very appealing, especially because it's supposed to be sort of like the first story. It's like the origin of Hyrule and kind of all that. So about what you're talking about about how the gameplay was janky, that just showed it right there. Yeah. That platform jump right there, where he jumps across, you can just see that it's just awkward and like he yeah, lands feel- with. The whole thing feels like together. Yeah, the whole <laughs> like, thing feels like um, it feels like a. It almost feels like some kind of ocean horn thing. It feels like a third party rip it, off of a Zelda little bit. Game. Yeah, and then the motion. And I feel, I, the, but the thing is, like the motion controls sort of differentiate that because that was such a Nintendo thing at the time. And if you take the motion controls out, I feel like it's just going to feel even more like some kind of like also ran rip off. It will. But Matt, some of those motion controls are so broken, dude. Oh, they're uh, terrible. Like they're... the bomb chew bowling thing. Like <laughs> when you would go, the problem was when you go to swing back to bowl, it would think that you already released it. Mm-hmm. So I would go back and then stop to go forward and the ball and the bomb chew would go. And yep. then I'd roll forward and it would do nothing. And like, I tried everything, everything. Tried sitting still, tried moving my arm in, a, in an exact like 90 degree angle like while I did it. And like, I just couldn't get it to work reliably. And then unfortunately, the biggest part of this game is that it, you have to do it reliably because the motion controls aren't some little fun mini game that you mess around with. They're integrated into the entire game and in like boss fights and very important moments in the game. Um I was very surprised at that was one of those times where I published a review and I, you know, I would never look at other people's reviews because I was putting them up at the embargo with everybody else. That was one of those times where my review went up at embargo and I was very surprised to see I was an outlier because to me, there were just obvious issues with this game that no matter how big of a Nintendo or a Zelda fan you were, you just could not overlook. So I was very, very surprised. The hype train just hit level five, by the way. Hmm. Awesome. Thanks you guys. You're awesome. Who's been making it rain in here? JM Rain, of course. Who else would it be? JM Rain, Tiny 2K again. You guys, you're awesome. Thank you, guys. It does. It is making a difference, by the way. Like when we get our Twitch Prime payout, I see it. I see the difference in what you guys are doing. So thank you so much. Um, but back to Skyward Sword. Like I don't really have much of a drive to play this again. I'll be no. perfectly honest with you. I felt like there were two dungeons that I really liked in this game. And the rest were okay. Um, still better than what we got in Breath of the Wild, to be fair. Um, yeah. But a lot of playing the game was just a chore, and I felt like by the time I got to the end of it, I was glad it was over. And I really don't have, unlike mm-hmm. most 3D Zelda games, I have very little motivation to play this one yeah. again. What about the you? O- the only not- notable thing about that is it gave me my default Wii controller. Oh, Yeah. So this is the Motion Plus that came with it. Yeah, that has the built-in Motion Plus. I actually have that game still, because I played that game on a debug back when Nintendo Mm -hmm. did that for like the one generation it did debugs, really. Um, So I still have that unopened, like the Hmm. big box with the controller and stuff in it. It's still sealed. Um, I mean, I would rather play almost any... 3D, 3D Zelda Zelda than this. Um, I realize it's kind of a content drought, um... But it's the it's the like if you had made me choose between this and like the uh, the rumored Mario 3D collection, it's probably the only Zelda that I would pick a Mario collection over this Zelda. Yeah, um, I would rather play an Ocarina Majora's Mask upres of the 3DS ports. I would rather I play forward ports from of the Wii U versions of Twilight Princess or Wind Waker. Um, yep. it's just it's it's the least. I mean, I, it doesn't does it deserve to be trapped on the on the Wii forever? No, but like. They're going to have to do a lot of work on this, too, by the way. Yeah. Like, of all the ports that they've done, this one will probably require them. And I do wonder how they'll do stuff, because, like, the the the, the motion control is, is really baked hard into the oh, combat yeah. system. And, how I mean, I, there's the sword swinging and all that. Yeah. Like, I don't know how you do that with buttons. 
um, without really reinventing the game to the point that like you wonder why even bother because then it's just going to be a generic kind of mediocre Zelda game. Yeah. Um, like say what you will about the motion control and I will because I don't like motion controls, but like the sword play at least sort of gave it a little bit of a unique flavor. Yeah, I didn't that, mind the sword play in all honesty. It was all the other more yeah. like intricate things that they asked you to do or context sensitive things that they asked you to do or mm -hmm. required you to do it within a time frame, assuming that it's not going to malfunction the first two times that right. you try like, to I do wonder it. If, like, I wonder if it would come with like some kind of like, I don't know, like some kind of Wii controller sort of replica thing that you'd sl slide like one of those Joy-Cons into or something like I mean, the Joy-Cons have the same functionality. The Joy-Cons have the functionality, but it's like they don't have the heft. They don't have the, right. you know, it doesn't feel like holding a sword. No, you're right. Um, yeah, so I wonder could. if it would if it would have some kind of specialized Joy-Con. They're going to have to do work to this to make it work, is the bottom line. It's and also, like, like up how, it and we're good. Well, the other question I end up having is, like, how do you make this work on the Switch Lite? I don't know. Where you can't take the controllers off. You have, you have to play it handheld. I mean, they're going to have to remove the motion controls. That's all there is yeah. to it. Like, they're going to have to create an option where you can play it without. Because yeah. I don't think, I think if they didn't do that, no one would care. If they just released this as it was with motion controls through the game 100%, nobody would buy it because they're all going to remember, oh, that was awful. And look, the Switch, the motion controls are better in Switch. And so maybe they could improve it a little bit. And I'll be honest, when I go to play it the first time, I'll try it with motion controls first. And if they're mm -hmm. crap, then I'll turn them off and I'll play the rest of the game without them or I just won't play it at yeah, all. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, more. like, I mean, most, my biggest complaint with motion controls tends to be that I, I never feel that um, what I'm doing is accurately reflected by the game. Like, yeah. I feel like I'm doing the thing properly, but it just won't register it. And that is a bigger problem with Nintendo stuff than any other stuff. Uh, certainly when I do VR stuff, like I feel like it's tracked way better than any of Nintendo's motion control oh, stuff yeah, has been. For sure. Yeah. But like when you do like something like Ring Fit works perfectly. So it's pretty crazy. Maybe <laughs> maybe the switch is finally the tech that was needed to kind of get you there. Because I don't so, hate motion controls. Like I am not a person who just hates no, motion controls. Like if I just don't like it. Them, I just don't like it because like ninety percent of the time it ends up feeling like a barrier between me and the game and not an enhancement. Yep. Um, Level five hit. Tr hype train. Mm. Whoop whoop. But that's Thanks not true of um of uh, what you call it, like Ring Fit. So I'm hoping that maybe these Joy Cons are the are the secret sauce for making Skyward Sword finally work. Although I don't think that will make it any better than like a B, even if that works or you get rid of the motion controls because I do find a lot of the design to be fairly repetitive and annoying. And like, there's that one boss you have to fight like three times. And yep, that's right. I forgot about that. Just, I don't know how I forgot. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's, it's, it's not a great game. Even if you, even if you were to make it like just a fully controller driven game, I don't think it's that, that good, but I guess it's better than nothing, which is pretty much the, the, the 2020 slogan for the second half. of the It's year better for than Switch. nothing <laughs> for everything. That's the way I'm looking at life right now. It's better than nothing. <laughs> I do hope they get the Twilight Princess and Wind Waker HDs on Switch eventually. It would be nice to kind of pull all those forward and and have that all those games sort of in one place. Yeah. But uh, I guess we got to go through this first. Yep. Uh, Gohan Rage, thank you for Twitch Prime, man. You waited till the end of the show, which is awesome. Always try to do that, guys. Either do it at the beginning or the end. Um, and then Croak gave us 100 bits. Thank you. That's freaking awesome. Uh, Nexus 6 Batty, thank you for the subscription. It's awesome. Hit that. We went full hype train again today, which is great. Um, so anyway, as you can see, no, <laughs> neither Matt nor I are gigantic fans of Skyward Sword. I do think if they remove the motion controls or make them better, it would improve the game and make mm -hmm. it more likely for me to play it again. But I remember the story and the characters in it. And just really none of it just struck me the way a lot of Zelda games do. So Yeah, it's like you're not going to get me to eat the shit sandwich by saying you took the shit off the bread. Yeah, and put a cherry on top of it or whatever. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> like, well, can I have new bread? No. Well, then no, I don't want that. <laughs> exactly. It's time to move on to our last topic of episode 225. And I think probably the biggest game that was released this week, because Tony Hawk doesn't count. That's just a demo. Yeah. Uh, there's Peaky Blinders that came out today, and there's like a couple other yeah, kind of mid range. Pathfinder, things. which if you're more of an RPG fan, that's probably a bigger thing than this. Yep, but we're going to talk what you're about into. it. Does uh, we're going to talk about Mortal Shell, which is the latest Dark Souls clone. So here's what I don't get, Matt. Mm -hmm. During previews for this, 
they they said that they were trying to streamline Dark Souls, but also improve the challenge, uh, in- increase the challenge, I should say. Mm-hmm. Now, reviews have come out for this game over the last couple of days, and a lot of the reviewers are saying that it's actually easier. They agree that it is streamlined, but they say that it's actually easier than Dark Souls. You have played it. I have not. Mm. Based upon what you've played so far, who's right? Um, I don't find it easier. Okay. Um, I think, uh, I mean, part of it might just be that it hasn't clicked yet and I'm not getting it because I'm still sort of in early days with it. Um, I understand what they mean by streamlining because it is a much more straightforward game. Uh, you don't create a character, you don't assign stats. Um, there's no number crunching in that regard. Um, you never really increase your stamina or your life bar, you know, as like in Dark Souls where you up your health and stamina. Yeah. That's all kind of like static. What you what you do upgrade are abilities, um, like a, like a, an ability tree. Like think of, think of like a skill tree sort of thing. Um, so the the and it, and there's no like side things. There's no there's no like side quest stuff. There's no like uh, and everything is sort of driving toward the same main goal. So I guess in terms of like streamlining, you could take it to mean we're we're taking away sort of the number crunching character building like how do i build my character thing and making it more like what ability enhancements do you want from a skill tree and everything you do is going to be pushing you forward to that main goal like there is no side kind of like find this special sword or whatever it's all part of the main story now are the abilities different enough that they can compensate for that lack of sort of character building um yeah i think it's harder uh, okay. Then I mean that might be because I'm not used to it. I do think it's a little loose. Um, the, the combat, is, you mean? The chat is wondering why we skipped Skyward Sword. Oh, because that that was my fault. <laughs> yeah, um, that's I was my fault. That too. Yeah, <laughs> I, the problem is I. So I'll I'll just explain what happened exactly. So in the original rundown, I had the retro Metroid Prime four story. And then right after that, Skyward Sword. So Mm -hmm. I was like, we don't want to do two Nintendo topics in a row. So I moved Skyward Sword down to after the PC topic, but before Mortal Shell. But on my notes page, I did not make the change. The page that I actually Mm. used to go through the show. So I had them backwards. So my apologies. We'll talk Mortal Shell now, and then we'll finish off the show with Skyward Sword. How about that? All right. There was a a lot of yelling because oh, <laughs> they want to hear us talk about skyward yeah, so we're i didn't not want to ignore that we're not going to skip it we're going to get to it guys sorry about that so anyway back to so Mortal yeah so the way this works is like you don't create a character you don't create like a class or anything what you, you're you play this you saw him there like that kind of like weird corpse looking thing like that's what you are you're like this weird skinny emaciated corpse it sounds kind of like the game that i just played hellpoint Hmm. Plays yeah. that weird humanoid like thing, right? That gets and armor eventually. It's sort of like that. This is, but it's using. So what what this thing can do is it can inhabit shells, mortal okay. shells. And you, the first one you find is a um, is like a knight in arm with armor, like a one handed sword and a knight with armor. And there's, I think there's three other shells you find, or maybe four other shells you find along the course of the the, the game. And those all kind of, they're basically classes. So there's a there's a um, like a more rogue, like like uh, like agility based one. There's a um, big tanky one, that kind of thing. And like each one of them has like a has their own ability tree. Okay. Um. So you kind of pick which one you prefer to inhabit, and like you can upgrade those as you see fit. Uh. But the first one you start with is sort of a balanced swordsman, who is what you're seeing in the B roll there. Um, the defense, so that, so that so most basically the, just prefab characters that you can choose more okay. or less. They're, they're like classes you pick up as you go and you don't have to decide which one, you know, forever you can just okay. sort of decide, you can just pick one, uh, and, and switch as you like, when you go back to sort of the central tower, which is like the home, the hub, the home base of the, of the game, which you see, uh, oh, no, that wasn't it. That's, it all kind of looks the same a little bit. It's, it's a little samey. It looks um, good though. It like, is pretty visually, good looking. I was pleasantly surprised by they, uh, they're stealing a lot of the aesthetics from dark souls but they're doing it very well yeah um, seriously i was impressed by how it looked so the the other big difference is how defense works so dark souls is a pretty defensive game the way most people play it uh you know you got your sword and board you got your shield uh and the rolling and um that is, the rolling's pretty similar in this you know invincibility frames don't run out of stamina stamina also used up when you do attacks so you got to balance defense and offense but the defense in this 
um, w when you pull the right, the left trigger, you basically you turn to stone, um, and you briefly turn to stone. And um, if this, if an enemy hits you while you're stone, it basically it ba makes them bounce off you. And sort they of don't turn them. to stone though. No, they stun. They get stunned for a second. Okay. Um, and then you can come out of the stone and counterattack. Um, the That's other, an interesting way to handle it. <laughs> the, 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 well, the interesting trick about the stone thing is you can turn to stone any time. Really? So you can turn to stone in the middle of an attack. So Could if you you're, do it to like make enemies leave you alone? No, but okay. what you can so you do can't use it as is like it, camouflage or whatever. No, but what you can do is if you are say attacking a guy, and I think you you saw it just right there. I think in the, in the B roll maybe. Um, if you're in the mid attack and you see that there, he turned to stone right there. And if you see that they're about to like hit you and you're not going to win that trade, you can turn to stone and hits you. And then you continue your attack and see right there. Good That's an interesting the mechanic. Yeah. Seeing it so, in the B roll. Yeah. yeah. So you, so you, you can play with that a bit and like turn it to your, it's a more, I, I would consider it a more offensively driven game than dark souls. How long can you stay stone? Is there a certain for about as long as it showed just there, and you okay. can extend it. The the, the, the sh some of the shells have like ways to extend it. The other thing is it has a cooldown, so okay. and you just saw you an arrow. You saw an arrow over. bounce off it there. Yeah, um, the, so it does have a cooldown, so you can't spam it over and over. Um, there are ways to reset that cooldown. There are ways to uh, extend uh, how long you can be stone. There are ways to uh, you know kill uh, kill two enemies in rapid succession. One of the early skills you can get. And that will reset your cooldown or shrink, uh, lessen the cooldown. It's not that long, but it's enough that you can't just like sit and turn. Do it every, with every enemy. Yeah. And then you can see on the back of the character there, there's sort of a glowing loop on the back of his belt there. Mm -hmm. So that is a, uh, it's called the Tainted Seal. You pick that up at the uh, top of the tower when you find it. And that is your parry. Oh. Um, so r that's left bumper on the Xbox. Um, if it's glowing like that, it means it's charged with uh, resolve, and you can you can parry with it. And so you'll you'll do a parry, and they will be stunned. And if you hit right bumper, uh, or I guess R one on, P on PS two PS four, um, if you have resolve in the bar, you will stab them and get some life back. Hmm. Okay. Um, so, so that is like sort a of, seesaw. Yeah, there, and there you okay. go. There's there's the parry, and and get your life back repost right there. Okay. So those are the kind of your basic mechanics that you sort of set up with at the beginning, and that's kind of all you get. Like that's the game. Like, and you just have to figure out how to use those tools and the and the things you pick up to sort of like play with it. And you'll see there, like he he just used a, an object there, and you got all the little little pips on the just under the description. The more you use items, the more mastery you get of them, and once you max out that mastery, you will you, using them will give you better results. Oh. Um, and then otherwise, you're sort of going through... Uh, there you can see him out of the shell. So that's that's what your character looks like under the shell. And um, if you Johnny get Hurricane killed... Johnny is asking which shell you use. I use So far, I've used the swordsman, the main... Uh, okay. That guy. I have not branched out in the new ones too much because the, I do pretty much play as a standard swordsman in most of these Dark Souls games. Okay. Except Dark Souls 2 where I play a pure mage. Um, but that isn't... You know, there's not a lot of distance combat in this so far. Um, so when you when you get killed, uh, basically that little desiccated corpse guy gets knocked out of the shell. Oh, and so okay. then you get you get back up and you've got a tiny bit of health, and so you can still fight, um, and you can either try to defeat the guy who killed you or run back and get back in the shell, which will give you your health and everything. You'll you'll basically get all your stuff back. It's that's like picking your soul up in Dark right. Souls. You get you get all your you're just picking up the shell and stuff. all your currency and your uh, glimpses, which are other things you use to upgrade the the abilities. You get all those back. Um, you can only do that once per okay. life, basically. So you get a little, little little glowy thing next to your thing, the, the stone turn to stone circle. Yeah. And if that's lit up, it means you'll get knocked out and you have a chance to get back into your your body. And continue to fight. If you get killed again, you die and go back to what your last sort of. They don't have bonfires. They have like checkpoints that are like sort of like sigils on walls and like the 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 madam, what's her name that lets you upgrade. So you'll respawn there, and then you got to go back Dark Souls style and pick up the little glowing, glowing red shell that's still where you died. Um, so that's all very similar. Uh, to me, I find a lot of it more difficult because. Um, it might just be that I don't know what I'm doing yet. I'm sure that's part of it. But also I find it a little loosey-goosey compared to Dark Souls. Uh, and that might just be the timing being different. And I'm used yeah. to the Dark Souls. 
but like, I do feel like I'm like, well, I feel like I should have dodged that. And I didn't, um, it's, and, and there's like some things early on that do help you where like, um, there's like bear traps laying around everywhere and you can lure the enemies into the bear traps and they get stuck there with their foot in the bear trap and you just like hack them until they die. So like early on, there's, it's sort of like a way to get some free, uh, tar, they call it instead of souls. Um, (laughs) And yeah, then, uh, and then there's stuff like, you know, some things is like, I just don't know what to do with them yet. Like you get poisoned by these frogs early on and the poison lasts forever. I hate poison. And it's just sort of dragging your <laughs> life bar down. I'm like, okay, I don't I know what it. To... So it's, it is, and there's no like Estes flask equivalent. Yeah, so really. you can't heal yourself? How do you? You can. Like so you have to find like mushrooms and, and uh, roast rats and like objects like that. To, it's to... a craft. No, you have to find it. Just find so, it. Like, Find them, yeah. I mean, you can buy them from from a, the merchant guy that's at the top of the tower. Um, but, like, so far you just have to find them. The, the mushrooms do grow in the same place every time, but, like, there's a timer on them, so you can't just yeah. endlessly pick mushrooms. Um, it's not too bad. Like, I, I've been making steady progress on it, but I do find it, because the defense options are, frankly, more limited in the sense that, like, <clears throat> you can only turn stone you know, at the right time, like you can't just like go stone willy nilly, like, like holding your shield up and the parrying with the tainted seal is reliant on having resolve. Like you can't so far, at least you just, I have not been able to just parry without it glowing. So it's not like you always have a parry at your disposal. You have to have, you have to have done some damage and built up a little bit of resolve and gotten to to glow and then you can do it. And uh, I just haven't found it as, as useful as parrying in dark souls. And, um, the boss, like there's one boss you run into early on that just, it, he he's very hard. Like I, I had a hard time kind of like learning how to do it. And because you can't, one of my big strategies in Dark Souls has always been to boost my stamina early on. So I yeah, can like yeah. get a little more leeway in doing yeah. the, the rolling and, and, and attacking and saying, you know, I can get an extra hit in that combo if there's an opening kind of thing and still have a roll. Can't do that now pocket. though. Can't do it in this game. <laughs> um, you got to choose the right shell, I guess. Yeah, that's kind of part of it. But like early on, it's, it was it was difficult for me. Uh, it is cheaper, so it is uh, thirty bucks. Um, so it's not full price. And uh, are there is there projectile combat in this at all? Because watching the bureau, I haven't seen any. I don't, I have not gotten a projectile weapon yet. I think I saw in one of the trailers it looked like he was going to throw his sword, but otherwise, like I haven't seen a bow or anything. No, I mean, and I've, there are enemies who do. Have oh, bows. there are. Um, but I have not gotten anything like that so far. Then maybe you do get one eventually because you can't. I don't know. There, you can see the the weapon. There's like four weapons you're going to get that are all okay. identified with the shells, and I don't think any of them are distance weapons. Wow. Uh, there are That's there cheap. there are, there are I, do, I do have like crossbow bolts I think in my inventory. So at some point I must get something like that, yeah, but I haven't have gotten to, it yet. Yep. So eventually you get it then. Yeah, um, but I wouldn't so, imagine that that is sort of the bread and butter. I I think melee is sort of where you're going with this. Are you happy that you bought this, Matt? And this, this is PC, PS4, and Xbox One, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I haven't really decided yet. Okay. Um, I'll admit that I'm not especially in the mood for a Dark Souls game right now. Um, Understandable. <laughs> but uh, but it is like quality. Like the quality's there. Like I've never heard of these Watching guys the before. Watching the B-roll, like, it looks really good. <laughs> yeah. Like I've never Shockingly heard of this before. Good. And like part of it is just sort of getting my head around how the, the defense works because I'm just not there yet. Yeah. But I the but it's not, I'm not like angry or frustrated at it. I'm just sort of like, oh, I'm interested to see like how I, I got to play with this more. And I'm, I mean, I am like three hours in, so it's not like I'm new necessarily, but I still don't feel like I have my head around how the mechanics work fully, uh, okay. at least not to the point that I feel like I can handle everything properly. And because there isn't really any sort of upgrades to the health or stamina, like, yeah, those first two guys you run into can kill you every time, like the whole game. Like, you're never safe, even in a way that in Dark Souls, everyone's, you know, in Dark Souls, you'll eventually level up to the point that the early enemy, little, like, you know, little corpse guys probably aren't going to hurt you that much if you get careless. These guys yeah. can always hurt you. No. So uh, in some ways, it, it's it's a nice well, I guess if you never level up, yeah. <laughs> it's like they're always going to be balanced perfectly. But at the same time, like you see there, like the stone thing is always effective. Yeah. Like you know, th- there's there are some some enemies that can kind of push through it. Um, but uh, that's usually only boss stuff. Uh, for the most part, that is your, then that's the thing I haven't got my head around is, is using the stone thing properly to kind of manage a crowd. Like Knowing when to use it and when not to use it. So you're yeah. not wasting and it on can, enemies. And-, and you can cancel it. Like you can break out of it whenever you want. And I have a hard time. Does the um, cooldown start over though still? Yeah. 
but oh, like okay. so like if you if you freeze in the stone mode and then you hit attack you can break out of it whenever you want you're not stuck in it oh, for okay. the, any you length can of cancel time. it at any you time. can cancel it whenever you want but i have a tendency to cancel it too soon and still get hit nah, so yeah like you'll get that I, timing down over time but, so, so it's a timing thing but it is yep. like it, it was an it's a nice surprise like this game like i didn't really know about it until like two days ago when the reviews started popping up on sifted Yep, uh, and I was like, "Oh, I guess I'll look at that." And then you couldn't pre-order it, like it, for whatever reason, you could only pre-order it on the Epic Game Store. And yeah. It wasn't pre-orderable on console until it went up on mid at midnight on Monday night. What? Um, so I did Wonder buy. Why. So I bought it on Xbox. I bought it uh, at, at midnight on Xbox and uh, started playing it. And, and with uh, smart delivery, you'll be able to play that on your Series X <laughs> in three months. <laughs> so it is. It is different, but it's the same. I mean, part of it is probably that like it looks so much like dark souls that like you almost want to play it like dark souls. And it's not that. So you're, you're going to have to like break some, you're going to break some uh, muscle memory, but I can uh, tell though by the chat, people are interested in it though. Yeah. But if you like, like Johnny dark hurricane souls, has played it. And so a lot of people are asking him questions about it. Yeah. But if you like dark Souls, also like there's some like great music in it. Um, really? Not like I, I, I really enjoyed them because like there's, you run into these like guys, these monster guys, they're at like little camps and they have like little guys who are playing like the lute, like at, around the campfire. And like some of the songs are kind of lit. Like some of the songs these guys are playing are pretty good. Like I, as a couple times I've come up to like a camp of, of bad guys and one of them's like been playing a song and I'm like, I'm just going to listen to this for a little yeah, just bit. Keep going, gonna, bro. Keep going. <laughs> awesome. Maybe I'll, I'll kill you last. Wow. Loot player. Like there you go. And you can oh. pick the, and you can pick the loot up and you can play it. Oh, wow. It. So and, it, and if you kick the loot around on the ground, it makes like clang, clang, like no clang way. sounds. So like there's, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of little touches in this game. Wow. Cool. I don't know. The more I keep hearing about this game, the better it sounds, Matt. I'll be yeah. honest. Like, I don't I'm think not a big Dark Souls guy, but... I don't think you'd like it. Um, yeah, I don't think it, I would either. Because it's I, so stamina driven. But yeah. like, um, and there's no way to really change that. Like, I don't think it's a... I mean, I've seen some reviews kind of call it like, oh, it's a beginner's dark... No, it's not. Like, I would... I mean, yeah, I'm having Yeah, some of the reviews have been hinting at that. Like, it's easy. I don't agree with that at all. Yeah, I, they've been I, calling I, it, like, the gateway game and, like... All I don't it. agree I'm with like, that. But the developers not. say they tried to make it hard, so they. Yeah, I don't agree <laughs> that it's a gateway Dark Souls at all. I don't. I don't okay. think. I don't understand where you're coming from. I mean, it is. I didn't say it's, that. They did. Yeah, no. Yeah, I don't know what they're talking about. It, this is this is a hard, very hard game, and if you don't already have a foundation of the Souls kind of formula, I feel like you're going to be struggling even more than I am with figuring out how to deviate from the. Souls well, you formula. telling me that you're still figuring it out? That <laughs> that's all right. I need to hear. I'm like, oh, I'm good. <laughs> but if you're ready for, if you if you like the Dark Souls games and you you're looking at that beer and you're like oh that looks really cool you will probably still think it's really cool when you play it and it, it is shorter i think than the normal you know it does have the dark souls kind of design where things like once you go to new areas they kind of fold back in on themselves uh -huh. and like there's that kind of like interconnectedness that makes dark Labyrinth souls what it is. level design yeah. but like it's not as expand it's not as big and long from what i've seen as as a dark souls game it is it is stripped down in the sense that um you're probably looking at more like a 20 25 hour game that's still a lot um but like yeah, there's 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 plenty there, um, and probably take longer if you're worse at it like I am. So uh, uh, I feel like it's going to be a while before I see the end of this thing. Wow. Um, and there is a sense of discovery. There's that sense of like, oh, what's in here? Oh, it's this. Oh, there's a lot more here. Oh, there's another thing. Oh, if I kill that guy, I get a new weapon. It's you know, it is a the the it, you, you, uh, you there is an element of piecing together the lore, piecing together what this means. Like you, you know, you look at these things and get you know, insights or whatever, and it shows you an area. And there's this guy walking around with a glowing red weapon. You're like, what does that mean? Okay, I guess I got to go find that guy. And then like you start to recognize places when you find them that are the things you saw in those visions. Right. And like there's this satisfying way of it all kind of coming together in the same way that Dark Souls had that like, kind of the lore scraps and stuff. Like it's legit. Like, it it's, sounds it's, pretty good, man. It's it's probably the most like blatant dark souls clone i've played but like they pretty Probably much one of the pulled best. it off <laughs> like they did it like <laughs> this is not like a lords of the fallen thing where it was a sort of like oh we'll just make that you know like right that. this is like so whoever made this game like loves dark souls and knows it they like there's it. Yeah. like they made their own version and enough that i wouldn't call it a ripoff but it's clearly inspired by in a way that it wouldn't exist without it but I think they've kind of managed to make it their own so far. Like wow. I don't know. I, I, That's a glowing endorsement. I and mean, for, I, and for half price, like it's making me think about playing it. And then I, then you I would get hate real. this game. You <laughs> would absolutely it. hate. I this know game. I would. I know I would. So anyway, there you go. That's Mortal Shell available now for PC, PS4, and Xbox One. It just came out today, yeah. right? And I think yeah, uh, or no, it came out Monday night, so Tuesday. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, and I, I keep thinking today is Tuesday. <laughs> That's right. the problem. Right. <laughs> I'm still not used to our Wednesday schedule yet. So, all right. So that's it. It's time for a word from our sponsor. And that is your cue to get your questions in the chat. We got a little extra time here today to get to some more questions. So if you guys have been holding some, maybe for the last couple of weeks and you want to ask them, fire away. Uh, so get them into the chat at Sifted Games so we can pluck them out of all the other comments. But before that, here's a word from our sponsor. Ready to get away from it all without losing all the comforts of home? DeShays Ryan Realty has a once-in-a-lifetime 200-acre estate for sale in Libby, Montana that gives new meaning to the phrase roughing it. This eye-popping main lake house on this sprawling estate has four bedrooms and bathrooms, phone, and internet. There are also separate guest and caretaker houses. It's the first time this property has ever been for sale, so don't let the chance to buy a slice of outdoor heaven pass by. It can be yours for $3.4 million. If you're interested, no matter where you live, contact Doug DeShazer at 406-291-1643 or DeShazerMT at gmail.com. He can also connect you with local realtors who can help you with your specific needs. If you want to see more, head on over to www.snowshoeranchmt.com. That's snowshoeranchmt.com. All right. Thanks once again to our sponsor. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to DeShays or Ryan Realty. And I hope that one of you are wealthy enough to be able to buy that home. And I, I hope when you do, you invite us all out so we can all have a big party at your new <laughs> palatial estate in Montana. At the beginning of that, the establishing shots, I just want me to re- put VO on it. Just, just the, <laughs> They say that a Shazer place has been haunted since the day of the incident. You know, it's, 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 <laughs> That's great. Uh, okay, we got some questions in here. Let's get to them. Again, we're going to answer a few more uh, today. So if you guys have been waiting to ask some, get them in. Uh, here's one from ETH. Actually, First, thank you, Wampler13, J Reed Vic7, uh, Texture Glitch. All you guys hooked us up with Twitch Prime. We really appreciate it. Um, first question from ETH Demon. What do you think of Microsoft Flight Sim? It may not be for you, but I would consider it to be the first true next gen game. Um, it's a game that literally can't run it. Agreed. It really is kind of the first next gen release, in all honesty, even though it's not coming to any consoles, but it's mm. using a lot of the same tech that the next consoles are going to use. So it is a good kind of barometer for you to check out and be like, this is what I'm going to be getting here when I spend my four or 500 bucks in a couple months. Yeah. I'd um, be surprised if we didn't get some kind of stripped down version on Series X eventually. Yeah. Um, obviously, um, it's, I think it's a little too complex to play without a keyboard and a, and a setup. Yep. Um, but you could like kind of you could strip it down and make kind of a like an arcade version at some point. You could. Um, I have not played it. You guys probably didn't expect me to play it. Um, I was a little surprised that Matt had not played it. Matt, why did you decide not to? Uh, first off, I don't know if my computer can run it. That uh, is a good question, actually. I don't know if mine. I have a GTX 1080. I don't know if that's good enough. I don't know. Second, um, I don't. I'm not a huge flight sim fan. I mean, I, we, I know we call them flight sims. We call them space sims or whatever. Right. But I'm, I, you know, uh, Ace Combat's about as far as I go. You know, I, I don't. I'm not interested in sort of the nitty gritty of of all the all the controls and pl- plotting your route and navigation and running my own airline and that kind of thing. Like that's not, you know, I'm not in, interested in that so much as, you know, dog fighting or whatever. Um, so like I, I can sit back and admire how gorgeous that game is. Like, you know, definitely is the, the first real taste of next gen. Um, but I am not probably going to jump in at like full price on that game. Yeah. I doubt I'm going to play it. I don't think my PC could run it. And I just don't have the time. Those games are very time consuming because it's all like real time. <laughs> like mm-hmm. it's. Uh, I mean, there is you can speed time up and do stuff. Yeah. You, know, you still got to. You still basically got to know how to take off and land a plane. Like yep. it's it's there. Yeah, it's a simulator. Like they mean yeah. it. Yeah, you know, there's assists and stuff like that. But it's like, I don't know. I'm I'm just more of a conflict person. So no. to answer your question, what do I think of it? I think it's impressive, but not it's amazing. Me. Yeah, like, it really is amazing. I've sent gifts of that to to my friends who like thought it was real. Like there's, there's incredible. Yeah, it looks a, that good. And I saw one of my, so one of my friends I know online, uh, he, he does, uh, he lives in Tasmania and uh, he took a, he took a, did a, he got the game and he took like a low pass over his like tiny little town he lives in. And he's like, it, like the buildings are correct. Like That's crazy little, like the, there's like a bridge or something outside of town that is not just a random bridge. It's the bridge. Yeah. yeah. It's like, there's elements of it that you can That's tell you, you they actually modeled it, you know, cause they're using <laughs> wow. the Google earth thing to but That's it's like crazy. Yeah. 
it's it, like you, you no matter how small the town you live in it is probably in there somewhere if you, if, you if it covers that part of the world so again um, really really impressive yeah. it really is uh, Jerry Vic Seven, looking at how Baron, EA, and Activision are are heading into a new console generation. Uh, can you two ever recall a time when the two biggest publishers were so unprepared for a hardware transition? Okay, let me think back to. I mean, I don't think Sega was prepared for the Saturn. Yeah, um, I mean, that's I don't a different re- situation. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I don't see what's any different with this generation than prior generations. Um, from no, EA, I, I felt that I usually you're gonna feel get like Madden and FIFA, and you're getting Madden and FIFA. Mm-hmm. And from Activision, you would typically get getting Call of Duty. And here's the funny part: you would get a Call of Duty and a Tony Hawk, which now yeah. we're actually getting. Um, I don't know. I don't see a difference, to be honest with you. Those guys are never really big at launch. Um, they may have mm-hmm. like one of their franchises there. Especially um, Madden. Madden's always like some weird stripped down thing yeah. the first time. They may look and they'll have that stuff there, but they they never have like a big like like you're not gonna see like Je- Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order 2 at launch. That's not how these publishers roll. They mm-hmm. they release their big stuff generally mid-generation and their annual cyclical games are usually the only games that are there at launch. Yeah, it's it's only Nintendo that launches stuff with big guns. Really. Yeah, it really is only Nintendo at this point. Uh, Commander Fett 03, uh, since you had to go back to the longer version of Game Face, would you consider bringing back the trailer of the week? Interesting. I didn't realize any of you guys missed the trailer of the week. Uh, we could. Um, I didn't miss it, <laughs> I'll be <laughs> honest with you. It is a great transition from the show into the Q&A. And right now, we're, you know, the, the ad is kind of acting as that. And, you know, if we lose our sponsorship or whatever... It may be a little awkward, but I did it a bunch before this, and it seemed to go okay. Um, I don't know. Probably not, to answer your question. Uh, but you're right. Like, you know, the original plan was that, you know, we we're Game Face was going to be shorter, and we are going to be breaking out longer discussions with games, but with COVID, that hasn't been feasible. So I'm already starting to... I think I've been in a little bit of denial, to be honest with you, about COVID in some ways. Like, I just keep thinking, oh, like, any week we're going to be able to be in the studio again, and it's just, like, not happening So I've started to look at sort of longer term plans. Like for instance, this shot that you're looking at right now for game face, like maybe improving this shot, like it actually having like a setup uh, when you guys can see where you guys can see me instead of just seeing in a computer chair, stuff like that. Um, I know. I really like to use that golf bag as a focal point. Nobody has noticed that I've been adding stuff to the golf bag though. Do you guys (laughs) see something back there? I can't. This screen's too small. Too small for you. But I added something to the golf bag, and no one has said anything about it. It's been there for a couple of weeks. You guys don't realize I've been messing with you all this time. But anyway, I've been operating under the idea of, well, you know, any week now we could go back to the studio. I need to get over that and start planning things for mm-hmm. this to be a little longer term than like I we're probably for. about halfway through here. We might be in America. Sadly, yeah, in America. Meanwhile, in Wuhan, they're at water parks, like spraying water on each other. So, <laughs> yep, that's where we're at. Anyway, um, so I do think it's going to be a little longer term. And so I'm starting to plan around that stuff a little bit. So this shot probably won't be like my, our spare bedroom bed for much longer. I'll probably get it fixed up and actually make it look nicer and start doing more stuff along those lines. Um, but the trailer of the week, I don't think we're going to bring it back. Unfortunately. Yeah. I would change up my shot more, but uh, this is the only room I have easy access to a hard line. Dude, so. you have a great shot. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, there, is there a shot better for a video game podcast than what you have right um, now? Probably not. I mean, I could move oh. it upstairs to the Transformers room, but that's uh, not directly related. Yeah, it's great, dude. I wouldn't worry about it at all. I'm the problem, not you. Uh, texture Glitch, thank you for Twitch Prime, man. Awesome. Uh, a bunch of jerks. Best username <laughs> ever. Are Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 the first games to be completely remade from the ground up twice? What other games that have been remade do you think should will be remade again in the near future? I can't think of any, to be honest with you. Like, I don't even know that they should have had to remake Tony Hawk twice. <laughs> like they just remake, failed well, the, the first time. Well, the other game I can think of is shadow of the Colossus. Yeah. Um, which got a remaster and then a remake. Um, hmm. Hard. Yeah. Demon souls. No. Because that's getting one one remake. Just one remake, yeah. Once you do the remake, there's never going to be a remaster, so it's death just cut off. Yeah, I mean, you could remaster the remake eventually. <laughs> yeah, guess, yeah, eventually, like 30 years from now or something. Yeah. I would like to see um, Witcher 1 get remade. Oh, 
Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, which I guess technically the enhanced edition was sort of a remaster. Um, and then uh, I would like to see Witcher 1 get remade and then they can package Witcher. Because I think Witcher 2 works pretty well still. So you, get, you remake Witcher 1 in the Witcher 3 engine, the red engine, and then you package 1, 2, and 3 together as the Witcher trilogy and just sell that for the next two generations. And that's your extra revenue stream for free. CD Projekt Red, you're, yep. you're welcome. Yeah, I think they figured that out already. <laughs> I would hope so. They were they were working on a remake of one for 360, and then they shelved it. So I would hope to, I'd like to see them pick that up again because that game very hard to play now. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, JM Rain ninety nine definitely gonna answer your question. You've been making it rain. What the hell is happening with Elden Ring? Nothing. I mean, I mean same thing is happening with the Game of Thrones books. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's George R. R. Martin working on something. So he, yeah. as soon as his name was attached, you should have known it wasn't going to be coming in a brisk the, manner. Developers are all probably still, still sitting around waiting for the the game Bible to come in. It's like, <laughs> we just need to yep. know what the name of the world is. I mean, <laughs> so we can start. Yeah, I've, I would not expect Elden Ring for quite a while, I no. would say. And I would not be surprised either if it ends up being a next gen game because I think like, it definitely oh, is definitely yeah, is unfortunately uh, Nexus Six Batty now uh, now when Mitch has his PC you should make him stream on Twitch um, to try and get partner okay so here's the thing about getting partner on Twitch and I would like it very very much for a number of reasons um, but the problem is is you have to keep your average stream audience up and you also have to stream a pretty good bit um our actually our averages for game face are way above what we need for partner the problem is we don't do game face like three days a week mm -hmm. um if we did then our audience would probably go down people wouldn't watch as often and we probably wouldn't hit partner anyway and that's the problem so if we start streaming games and typically when we stream games our audience is like a quarter or a third of what shows up for game face that brings your average down it makes your chances of becoming partner actually less um, if I thought when we streamed games that our audience would explode, our audience would double, we'd be doing it every day. But that's not what happens. We end up with like a shadow of our usual audience watching game streams, which would bring our average viewership down, which would make partnership nearly impossible, which is kind of impossible now anyway, because we're only streaming, I don't know, I guess 12 hours a week, a month or something like that. So I don't know. It's, I would really like to be able to get partner, but it's, it's this tap dance that we do between streaming too much, not streaming enough. You know, I was worried that when we did Wednesdays, our audience would fall off, but it actually followed us here, which is great. And I really appreciate that you guys did that. You followed us to a new day. But yeah, partnership right now, unless our streams just start getting a lot bigger, is just not within striking range. Um, Mike's Q. Why is it that so many video game developers um, in the U.S. are in the West? Because growing up, I had aspirations to work for one, but there aren't that many on the East Coast. It's just the way it worked out. It started that way. Honestly, I think that's just really what it is. Like, if you look at game development, it's still primarily centered in California, and then there's a big pocket in Texas. It's always been that way. When it started, that's the way it was. It was all in California. It was, yeah, it started in Silicon Valley. Like yeah. that's where that's where Pong came from. It's where you know Bushnell started. Every Atari and all that. It's where all that came from. And then it sort yeah. of spread out, um, and and branched out to different places as time went on. But like in general, that was it. It's California based. Yep. And it's just stayed here. And look, I hear you now. It's like the cost mm -hmm. of living here is so expensive and taxes here are insane. I mean, there's so many reasons why if you own a company, you would want to move it out of California. Why they haven't done it, I don't know, to be honest with you. Although I would argue that there are a lot more studios around the rest of the United States now than there were even five years ago. So yeah. it's changing, it's evolving, but you're right. Like pretty much right now, if you want to work in the industry, you need to move mm -hmm. to Cali or not at all because everyone's working remotely anyway. Yeah, so, and also like part of it is like you want to set your company, your game company up somewhere that people want to live. Yep. And California was that for a long time, still is yep. obviously. But that, you know, it, look at the places where they, you know, it become sort of little mini hubs like, uh, like, um, uh, Austin, you know, another That's very desirable place. Like Austin is still or, big um, for yeah. game development. And it was even back like yeah. 20, 30 or, years ago. Or Raleigh, which yep. is, you know, sprang up around Epic. Yep. Um, and then you see places that are just like not, you know, like, is, is there any, are there any developers in Chicago other than NetherRealm? 
I mean, like, Midway used to be there. Midway but, used to be. I guess where never Nether Realm spun out of. But like, yeah, it's uh, it's you know, New York was only Rockstar and Rebellion for a while. Was it Rebellion? Still, pretty much is. I mean, to be honest with you, there aren't many developers in New York. There yeah. are none in Philadelphia. Not any. There might be a it's couple. Inter- it's always interesting to see like where kind of be- with the places it becomes sort of a hotbed of game, like how uh, Guilford in England. Yeah. Became a lot of it has to do with because that's where Molyneux was and all kind and right and networking and are there mm-hmm. other studios there? It's going to take a while, Mike's Q, but I know you just moved too, actually. I think you just moved into a new place, but I know that it's not anywhere close to California. Mm-hmm. Um, so when, when the other thing to remember is like coming out of this, the pandemic, like I think, you know, being on site is not going to be as important anymore because it's been proven that this can work. So like having to live near the office may not be as important anymore uh, to, to working somewhere you want to work. Like it might be a remote option now. Um, so having to move out to California to live, you know, near whatever game developer you want to work for might not be a requirement anymore. May not be a thing anymore. This. Yep. So, and good, like, great. Like the, you, you, you get more talent, you get more uh, wide cast a wider net in terms of who you can hire and who can work on your stuff. And you don't demand people move to high cost of living places and leave things behind that they'd rather not be leave behind. I think that's an entirely positive thing. Yep. Um, wait, is there a, qu- a question for Mitch? Uh, Matt's thoughts on Mulan going to Disney Plus for an additional thirty four ninety nine. If it works, will Black Widow follow? Uh, yes, Black Widow will follow if this sells. Um, Do you think it will? That's a I think, lot. I think it might. Uh, I'm not. Sh- I'm not sure. Um, I, I have a hard time calling the Mulan thing uh, just because I don't fully know how popular that that is. Yeah, that IP kind of the, to me is a complete mystery. Because um, I've only seen the animated movie once or twice. I think it's not one of my go-tos really from the Disney Renaissance nineties period, uh, even though I did like it, but I will say this, uh, as a Wuja fan, uh, of, you know, of, of Chinese cinema, like, you know, wire foo, as some would call it. Uh, I think this thing looks great. So, um, if it was coming to theaters, I would definitely go see it in theaters. Uh, and if I did that, I would probably take someone with me and that would cost me about 34 bucks. So I might just go ahead and get this cause I want to see it. I don't know. I would definitely pay the money to see Black Widow if they. Do what do you that. think most people are going to do, Matt? I don't know. I really don't know how to call this one. There is no precedent is for this. I won't pay it. I mean, no way. Um, right, but it's like all they need is like a quarter to a third of their subscriber base to do it, and they will make as much as they made they would have made in theaters domestically, and they won't have to give half of that to the movie. Yeah, movies. I mean, they'll make so, more profit. I hope it thing. works. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you are you are watching a paradigm shift in film. Right yeah, now, this is a, sure. it's a it's not a great situation, but like it's fascinating to see this. There is no this was coming, but this has sped the timeline. Oh, up yeah. by probably this a was decade. coming like 10 years from now, maybe. Yeah, like. it's, it's, a, it's a decade fast forward on this. Yeah. Um, and you're going to have holdouts like Christopher Nolan's never going to let Tenet be done, done streaming because he thinks IMAX is the only way to watch a movie. And like, I'm not, I'm not going to go risk my life for Tenet. Folks. Nope. Sorry. <laughs> not happening. Um, but I, you know, I will think about, also I'll think about uh, paying that for Mulan uh, to ensure that I get to do it with Black Widow in a few months because I really want to see Black Widow. Um, the thing is, I do think it's expensive. Like it is still a deal if you're going to pay like for two tickets and maybe a snack at like an LA theater. I think in non-urban areas, like outside of the major metropolitan areas of the country, that is more than you're going to pay on a Oh, that's not a movies. deal at all. Like no, back not in at all. Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where I'm from, I went to see Star Wars for like seven dollars. <laughs> like, yeah. and that's the problem is like, like I don't know how the scale. You know, I assume they've done a lot of research on what the scale should be, but a lot of other other companies that are doing the same move are charging more like twenty bucks. Yeah, um, which is harder to argue with because even even like a prime even in night, Carlisle, that you're going to Carlisle spend. nighttime <laughs> tickets going of two people is going to cost about twenty yep. bucks. You're right. Um, so that might be a thing they learn. Like they can't charge that much. Maybe they'll try it a little less uh, with uh, Black Widow. Hope they get more people to make up for it. Like, but I assume they're trying to strike whatever balance they think that their research shows here. Um, quite frankly, I'm 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 interested in Mulan, but I'm more interested in Bill and Ted Three right now because and that's going to be cheaper. I guarantee you. <laughs> I guarantee um, it <laughs> definitely, without a doubt. All right. That's it for all the questions. So that's it for Game Face episode 225. Uh, if you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter at Dinfire. You can find Matt at M Kyle. That's K E 
I L. And you can find Sifted at Sifted Games on Twitter. And if you're listening to this show on Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening to the show, um, if you want to know when the show is going live, you'd like to become a part of it, follow us at Sifted Games or head over to patreon.com slash, I almost said shalash. I've got shaniki, shalad, shanake in my head, apparently. Um, slash uh, sifted, you can pledge as little or as much as you want every month, uh, and we appreciate every single dollar that we get. Uh, before we go, I actually have a pretty big announcement to make. Um, we're doing a very, very special episode of Pact or Factor, and the day for it is September 3rd. It is a Thursday. It is an appointment episode of Pactor Factor. I'm not going to spoil anything else yet because we're still working really hard on it behind the scenes, including Pactor, I would add. Um, but we do have the solid date. It is Thursday, September 3rd. Just kind of subconsciously set aside a couple hours in the morning, afternoon-ish on that day. We have something really cool and really big coming down the pipe. Um, and I'll obviously share more about that uh, at a later date when I can, and I have more details for you guys. But something really cool is going to happen, and I'm really excited about it, and you guys should be too. But anyway, uh, like I said, I'm at Denfire. Matt's at M. Kyle. Sifted is at Sifted Games. Our Patreon is patreon.com slash sifted. Thanks to every single person who gave us bits today, uh, people who subscribe via Twitch Prime, people who are making it rain, giving other people subs. You guys are awesome, and I love you all so much. So on behalf of Matt and Jared in the shower, this is Shane. Game face is up and out. <laughs>